Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close, I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value came in, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate. And how they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. Yeah. Okay, so episode number 352 today, home team, a bunch of stories. We got a Manect update to see what's going on there. We got to find – last night we had dinner. It was pretty heated. I don't want to tell them what happened, the fight that broke out. I don't want to get into that, know, but it was pretty was, heated. So a bunch of crazy stories. Slapping and one, hair pulling. One, Millet from Argentina gave a speech after being introduced by Klaus Schwab, and you have to see how he opens it up in the first minute. It's a 23-minute speech. We're not going to watch the whole thing. We'll watch the first minute later on. I highly recommend you go watch it. WEF is saying a bunch of different things while they're together right now. Uh, NAC, which it stands for Natural Asset Companies, which means uh, uh, they, can, they can buy and own your air in your area. You can own the land, but they own the air. It's a lot of different things that they're pitching. New York, New York City Stock Exchange, today's the last day for people to talk and try to get rid of it. To then, make their voices heard. Then there was a video clip from Jamie Dimon. Jamie <clears throat> Dimon said something that even the hosts that were listening to him were like, uh, why is the most powerful guy in banking saying what he's saying right now about Trump? Wait till you hear this. I'll play this clip for you. C.J. Stroud, who just won a game for the Houston uh, uh, Texans. Texans. And, uh, you know, when he won the game afterwards in the interview, you have to hear how ABC edited what he said in a post-game interview for the world not to see. What do you think they cut out? Don't say anything. I don't know. We'll play the that. clip for you and show you both of them. Then there's Ohio. Ohio, uh, in certain areas, came up with a permit-free carry of guns. You have to see what happens to the city with the different stats. Oh, weird. California lost. Tom has numbers from last night on what happened to California after all the people decided to leave California to other places. Then at the same time, we're going to talk about the story on how Russia, Iran, and China are making moves that could trigger World War III. Bill Ackman warns Democrats after a landslide Iowa caucus win that Trump is going to crush Biden. Is he delusional? Does he know what he's talking about? We'll talk about that. Depopulation could make over half of U.S. city ghost towns by 2100. Top pharma CEO says preparedness for a new pandemic has not improved. Then we have Red Sea risk. To oil, very real. Prices could change rapidly if supply is disrupted, says Chevron CEO. Chinese scientists create COVID strain with 100% kill rate in mice. As you just wake up one day, you're like, you know what, guys? Why don't we build something that's got a 100% kill rate? Why would you build that? Let, because we have time on our hands. That's what these Chinese scientists did. White, black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans are all back death of DEI poll, all back death of DEI poll, which we'll show you what that means here in a minute. Nikki Haley under pressure from donors to defeat Trump, Donald Trump in New Hampshire after Iowa caucus loss. Bernie Sanders to vote freeze aid to Israel. U.S. puts Houthis back on the terrorist list, and U.S. carries out additional strikes against Houthis in Yemen. And then last but not least, the bill is coming due on a record amount of commercial real estate debt, which we will discuss, and it may be a couple of the stories if we have any time left. But with that being said, look, the most important election going on on PBD Podcast is the race to 500 on Manek. And, and I want you, because it, tonight, today, Adam has a speech that he wants to give to everybody. So does Vinny. Everybody knows last time Vinny said it. A hundred plus of you within 24 hours connected with Vinny. I love you guys. This is Thank what you. the score looks like right now. At the top, Vinny was, I believe, last place. He went to second place. He's officially taking the throne from Tom. And here's what the scores look like. We did it. Vinny's at 307 with only 193 left to 500 to win the suit. Come on, guys. Again. Tom is at 275 with a massive support behind him. They're not letting up. There's a group that wants to help Tom out. And Adam's at 179. He's convinced still. not. By the way, he's not giving up or anything. He's convinced he's still going to pull it off. And win. So with that being said, with Manek, by the way, we got a bunch of other people that just joined Manek in the last couple of days. Brian Callen officially got on. Brian! A bunch of different – there's a couple of guys that are coming up climbing, climbing 10, 20, 30, 40 Manek's in no time. I love what this app is doing. 
questions that come up that you can actually get a response back from somebody when you DM them. Ask them a question. I believe when people say, how come nobody responds back when I DM someone? Because they value their time. On Manect, what you get to do is to say, listen, expert, listen, influencer, listen, somebody that I want to ask you a question. I so value your time that I'm willing to pay to get a response back on a text, on a video, or a FaceTime phone call with you. I believe your 15 minutes are worth this. I'm willing to connect with you. So with this race being this close, Vinny, 307, 275, 179. Tom, do you have anything to say to your supporters? Well, first of all, thank you for your questions. I get a lot of great questions about career, about job. I got a small business. This is what I'm doing. I really appreciate answering them. I answer all of them. And you'll notice a lot of them I will answer in voice text. I'm starting to use voice text more. So you'll hear my voice. You know it's me. It is really me. I give you all these answers permanently. No bots, no chat GPT, no assistant doing it. You are getting it back from me. I thank you so much. And so if you've got questions... Job, career, small business, how do I finance this? A couple of great questions have been like on, hey, do I start my own business or do I keep earning bus- you know, money now? And we've gone back and forth a couple of questions. Just leaving people that I found them. Thank you for your support. And if you send your questions in, remember, it's only $24 in the first quarter of this year. 2024 I, for time. For 2024. Love, and I'll, I'll answer a question for you. No, Vinny, no, 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 no. Age before beauty. No, go no, ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Rock, paper, scissors. I'll give you a no chance. chance. No, Roche, I, they're going to ro- roast him. Rock, I have one competition that's going, and that's to get to 500. But I'll rock, paper, go. scissors. See who goes next. Ro- roche no, 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 no. Everyone's waiting. No, they, can, they can wait. Adam, he's in the lead. I'm in the lead, actually. Okay. You know what? He is in the lead in this very specific contest yeah but i'm gonna lead overall congratulations okay no so like i get it you're winning this little two-week stretch and i'm proud of you you think i'm about to go negative i'm about to do the exact opposite number one for you guys out there if you haven't downloaded the app manect and you have no clue what we're talking about take a second download the app this app is a game changer okay it is a game changer for specific advice for whatever you're looking for your life we are consultants We are coaches. We are changing lives. Here's what I'll tell you about my friends, Tom and Vinny. If you need motivation, if you need a laugh, if you need positivity of your life, this is your guy. This guy is a breath of fresh air every single day of my life. Now, does he know all his stuff? Does he have rock for playing sometimes? Sure, but he's a comedian. Wow. What? What? No, a subtle jab. No, no, no. Oh, it's the humble jab. Jab. Okay. okay, hold on. I'm it's not on. Done, it's but on. I, I genuinely mean I'll be here if you need me. I genuinely mean this. For a brain. As positive <laughs> and as motivational as fun as it gets, Vinny Oshana. Tom, this guy's a gentleman. Let me tell you something. You're getting an absolute bargain of a deal for $24.99 for this guy to answer your questions. And it's like he should be genuinely charging a thousand bucks for what he's doing, but he's actually doing yesterday. He was such a gracious guy, a mensch. He jumped on a call for free with a buddy of mine, a young guy that's a startup entrepreneur. I not thank just you for any that. young guy. Tell yeah. him where he was and what his decision is and how he's been serving. Actually, I'm not allowed to talk no, about you're not that. Allowed but to he's, talk but about he's it. Yeah. okay. But just know that he's doing some very important stuff. If you want business strategy, if you want fundraising, if you want pitch decks, Tom's your guy. He's an absolute gentleman. And you know who the PBD is, a beast. I don't know if you can afford him, but if you can, it's worth every penny. But here's what I'll say about you and why you should consider reaching out to me and my neck. I know that we have this contest, and, 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 and I, I joked about um, rooting for Vinny because the guy needs some new suits and he needs some new clothes in his life. But here's what I'm most proud about. I don't need, That's true. I don't need the suit. I don't need to win Adam, the contest. 30 seconds. Ah, I a want a seven-minute speech here to us. It could have been done if uh, we, Vinny did the rock, paper, scissors. Here's what I like. By far and away, I'm number one in the app because I sit there and I do 15-minute phone calls with people that are actually trying to change their lives. I've seen and I've helped 750 people, different people, go from ordinary to extraordinary, go from zero to hero, to go from average to savage. So if you want to change your life and upgrade your life, reach out to me on my next. Vinny, wrap it up, Vinny. My fellow Manectors, <laughs> PBD podcasters, valuetainers, first of all, I love you, every single one of you, okay? Um, and I, I can't say nothing bad about Tom. I really can't that, say anything. That perfect. But yeah, you just, you got to get in there. But I want to say thank you for all of you that have been messaging me. I, it's been like a second job for the past couple of days, but you know what I'm getting going to say? And I have nothing negative to say to, but, about Tom and nothing to say about Adam, even though he said, yeah, I have a rock in my brain, but that rock is actually a diamond. But uh, <laughs> I want you to ask yourself one question. Adam, who'd you vote for this last presidential election? Who'd you vote for? 
Joe Biden. If you want that person making decisions for your finances and your life and dating, that don't you dare do it. Guys, Manek with me. We have how many left I have? 200. Let's push you for it. Win. Guys, let's do it today. Let's be, Let's just put this thing to bed and let's make America right. connect again. Let's Thank you. Let's put the faces out there, the QR code, whoever it's you want to support. Just go on the Good QR one. code, download the app, and you'll go directly to wow. Adam. Vinny. Come on, Tom. baby. Come on, guys. Right. Let's go. Okay. Let's get Ron, right. Ron, and Ron, Nikki, let's, thank and you I will, much. Let's get I will give a shout out to the 10 people at the end of the first podcast. 10 you did first, five, um, I did five, five last time. Today. The first 10 right. that Manek me, good. I'm going to give you a shout out. Let's go, You're baby. Right. The first 100 that Manek me, I'm going to give you. I'm going to read your names one by one here. Let's get into it. Pat, do we have a first story? Yes, we do. Okay. So do me a favor. Pull up the Jamie Dimon clip. So here's Jamie Dimon. This is a man that's running. Uh, you know, Chase, that, you know, depending on what numbers you look at, on a daily basis, around $7 trillion moves with Chase. Okay, money comes in, money goes. Seven transact- trillion? Seven trillion buys, Jeez. purchases, transfers. That's a lot of money, you know, that this company uh, has influence over. And he's on CNBC. And look at the way he breaks down the 2024 election and how the left mm. have been saying certain things. Just watch this and pay very close attention. Maybe... Maybe the most powerful man in the financial industry today, Jamie Dimon. Go ahead. People are growing. They're hungry to grow. They're innovating. It's, it's everywhere. It's not just Silicon Valley. So we've got this great hand. But when people say MAGA, they're actually looking at people voting for Trump, and they think they're voting, and they're basically scapegoating them, that you are like him. Uh, and, but I don't think they're voting for Trump because of his family values. And if you look, just take a step back, be honest. He was kind of right about NATO, kind mm-hmm. of right about immigration. Mm-hmm. He grew the economy quite well. Trade, China China tax, virus. tax reform worked. Wow. He was right about some of China. I don't. Th- I don't like what he did. No, I said China virus. Yeah, I understand. When he, when he uh, shut money. up. He, and I don't like how he said things about Mexico. Boy, I don't like. But words. he wasn't wrong about some of these critical <sighs> issues, and that's why they're voting for him. And and I think people should be a little more respectful of our fellow citizens. And when you guys have people up here, you, have, you should always ask the why. Not like it's a binary thing. You're supporting right. Trump. You're not supporting Trump. It, Why are you supporting Trump? It's hard to Trump? hate 75 million of your fellow Americans. And it's, I, I agree. It's done crazy. The left makes the it Democrats pretty easy. The have done a pretty good job with the deplorables, the hugging onto their Bibles and their beer and their guns. I mean, really? Like, could we just stop that stuff and actually grow up and treat other people with respect and That's listen right. to them a little bit? You know who he's and, talking and, to? Hillary Clinton. 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 That's the thing that you're trying to represent is, you know what that's saying? War, money, giving away. T- I, I, don't, I don't like that. I lo- it I could also that. mean anti-authoritarian regimes like uh, Putin. It could also mean that. Oh, yeah, the guy that was going to start World War III and he's in Trump's pocket. I'm just, I, I, know I, that, I know that you're a fan of Putin. I'm look not. At that. Well, well, look let me, at, let me, I'm not by the way, by the way, by the way, very good observation because why wear that when you can wear the red, white, and blue, the yes. most beautiful, you know, you know, flag. Why didn't you wear that? Totally get that. But you know where he's at when he's having this conversation. Tom, what do you think about when someone like him who, you know, many would say he's supported presidents on the left, you know, and, and he's probably not a pro-Trump guy. He says something like this. What does this do to money people on Wall Street? Forget about what it influences the average day-to-day person. How about the Wall Street guy that's like, oh, my God, did you hear what Jamie did? Did you hear what Jamie said? Did you hear what Jamie said? What kind of influence does he hold and what does he do? Jamie Dimon has consistently been either a calming force or a rational force. When you had the interest rates and they were stepping up, 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 and everybody was kind of freaking out because Ben Bernanke, what do we have, eight increases or whatever it was in one year, he was the calming force. He was the stabilizing force. When the banks failed, remember we had, people forget, one year ago we had banks failing and we built a special federal program to bail them out. Remember that? It was an emergency program, what was going on. Jamie Dimon, now, was he opportunistic, took advantage of that? Sure he is. But I see a rational force and a stabilizing force, and I hear echoes in his voice of the things that, like, Bill Maher said. And the thing that that we saw John yesterday talking about it and rolling his eyes, leaning back and talking. 
I think Jamie Dimon hit it on the head. Why don't we grow up a little bit and ask people why they support him and not make it some binary choice that you, you, you endorse all of his family values. I think that is the most eloquent part of what he said. I don't Trump's, I don't support Trump's family values, but here, 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 and here, he rationally and elegantly did it. I think he's going to have a calming force on wall street. And I think there's a hedge going on in that calming voice. Adam, because, what do you think? So I think we're, I think Jamie Dimon is at exactly where I'm at politically, is that we weren't fans of what was going on in 2015 and 2016. And what we've also realized is that a large part of why we weren't fans was because the media doctoring up what we saw. So I think with everybody, you have to evolve and you have to take in new information. And this guy's what I would call a rational actor. And you're seeing what's been happening over the last four years. And Biden campaigned on bringing people together, not being so divisive. That's the reason that he beat Trump. Trump represented chaos at that time or perceived chaos. But what we realize now is that people, rational people, people who are reasonable, people that are process information, people that are, they have ability to evolve and not cling to their position say, you know what? Maybe this guy wasn't as bad as the media made it out to be. Maybe he isn't this racist. We all know how watered down racist is a term these days. So someone like Jamie Dimon is looking back and saying, listen, guys, you, MSNBC, CNBC, NBC, mainstream media, you're kind of guilty. So I'm going to be a, a gentleman here and I'm going to actually do what I can. Arguably the most powerful man in finance other than maybe Larry Fink, BlackRock. Yep. So when he gets on there and starts semi lecturing the hosts of MSNBC and directly lectures Hillary Clinton saying, listen, the basket of deplorables comment, the clinging to your guns and clinging to your Bibles. Guys, ask why. Do better research. Dig deeper. So I'm right where Jeremy, Jamie Dimon is I these got a days. Score. I got a score I want, I want you to give everybody here. Specifically, Tom, I want to start off with you. Score everybody moving forward at what percentage their establishment, what percentage their non-establishment. Okay? Mm. For example, what would you put the split on Trump? What's Trump's split on establishment, non-establishment? He's like... So, he's like 90, 10 against. Okay, so 90% non-establishment, 10% establishment. Yep. Score DeSantis. 60, I would say 70, 30, yes. He establishment. is establishment. Yep. Put Haley. Oh, my gosh. She's 90, 10. The other way, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I'm with, Do you understand what I'm yeah. doing Pure, right now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so remember, nobody is 100-0, okay? Non-establishment. Nobody is because... No matter what, you have to negotiate with the yeah, establishment. You have to okay, so you can't be a hundred. If you're a hundred zero, you're an anarchist, unreasonable. You can't. Yeah, so, exactly. so, so you don't believe in anything mm -hmm. that we're doing, right? Okay. So, you know, it, it, military is a form of establishment. Yeah, so remember what I'm saying here with this part. Yeah. Okay. So, so now here, think about this part. <clears throat> What score would you give Jamie Dimon? Oh, very high establishment, but give me a the free score. thinker. I would say eighty percent, even say maybe 75? maybe even higher. What would you say, Tom? In the finance uh, establishment, he's ninety nine. I would say seventy thirty. Okay, the part so of that's, Jamie Dimon that I believe is a rational open market. Guy. Okay, Larry Fink. What percentage is establishment? What percent are not? No, he's he's no. he goes the other way from more 80, than eighty five fifteen. Uh, okay, more perfect. Than so my point Dimon. here is this: when we're judging these characters and these individuals. You're not going to get 100%. You know, he's wearing a Ukraine pin. I'm, what are you doing wearing a Ukraine pin? Okay, I don't agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't wear a pin, or if you're going to sport a pin, wear a Chase pin because you're proud of the exactly. company you uh, support. Or guess what? Wear a America pin is what you, 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 know, you, you, you support. I'm not a pin guy myself. I always forget the pins. I was like, how come you forgot to wear? I'm like, did I even forget to wear my own pins for the companies? But, you know, I wish I was a pin person. I forget a lot of different things. I'm a pin guy. But if you do right a pin, here, I know you are. I have a, I have a way, neck pin. Just so you guys know. Like, and by the way, you always have it on. I rock always it. have it on. I rock it with Tom pride. Puts a U you put a USA pin out, Tom. I'm, I'm USA the majority right. of the time. Yeah. So, but you but think, stopped wearing your Ukraine pin like months ago. Yes. But think about it from that. this standpoint. Moving forward, how I would judge people on what they're saying and what they're flipping or what their position of saying what they just said is, Go based on this. So a 75% establishment person just said that about MACA? What? Yeah. Are you Shocking. kidding? So that's the part mm -hmm. that ought to get people to say, I would have never thought he would have said, let's, let's face it. He was right on NATO. He was right on economy. Mm -hmm. He did good with this. He was right with China. I don't like the fact when he said this. He was right. So that's the part where somebody ought to look at us and, and establish that came out of an establishment yeah. person's mouth. Yeah, that guy right there, Jamie Dimon. You know who speaks to? 
He speaks to every single powerful person in the establishment, every one of them. By the way, two days ago, I asked a question from you guys, and I've been asking this question a lot this last week. Do you think the phone call is being made where Jamie Dimon and the establishment Wall Street guys are calling Trump saying, if you're willing to put Haley as your VP, you're a lock for president. We will publicly support you. Wow. Do you think a phone call like that is made? I believe a 70% chance that phone call is made. I didn't say it's received. Yeah. I said it's made. And they're saying to him, we will come behind you and we'll give you 200, 300, 400 million dollars and we will go out there and help raise and we will defend because we know what you did with the economy and you were right, okay? Now the question becomes, will Trump entertain that conversation? I believe he will entertain, mm -hmm. but I also believe a lot of the people on the inside that are 100% supporters to him, he's going to bring it up to him and ask the question that I believe Trump asks a lot. I think Trump say, what do you think, guy? I think Trump will say, what do you think? But he's going to make the decision what he's going to He's going to say, so what do you guys think about the phone call we just got? Should we consider this? Do you agree with him? And it's not going to be asking everybody. It's only going to be asking two, three, four, five people that he fully trusts with a score of 90 plus, right? Yeah. And I believe a couple of them are going to say we ought to entertain it. And I believe three out of five are going to say, hell no, we shouldn't entertain it. One of the three, I believe, is a family member that's going to say don't do it. But I believe after a message like that that just took place, and we're in the negotiation phase right now that Tom was talking about two days ago. I think that is a message of Jamie trying to say, hey, whisper, if you accept our offer of putting Haley as your VP, I'm going to do more of this stuff for you. I'm just speculating. I, but I think I, that's a possibility. I think, that, I think, I think that'd be, uh, that's a, uh, I, I wouldn't say 70. I maybe go 60, 55 percent because think about it. And that says a lot when it comes to that, that type of attitude of, hey, we want a Haley who's vocally saying that she just wants war, war, war. Her husband's in the defense contracting thing, Pat. She became a millionaire. And by the way, coming from a guy that's wearing a pin that's basically the war, sending billions and sending all this money, I could see how that phone call would happen. I still don't think, and I would lose so much respect for him, if Donald Trump brings in that swamp creature mm -hmm. into his cabinet, I... I you would 100% still vote for him, though. No, I wouldn't. No, you I wouldn't sit, vote for Donald I would Trump sit on the he brought in Nikki Haley? I would sit on the sideline. Stop because, it. Of course I would you sit This the is very line. important. I would that, sit by on the, the sideline. By, by the way, I know what you're thinking. This is very important here. Yep. Because he is a part of a, 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 a true super supporter of what they did to what the establishment mm -hmm. did to him. 100%. So I think that there's a part, the question becomes behind closed doors, what do you think? Can I, sorry. Tom's so, been trying to say something for ahead, a few Tom. minutes. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, so I agreed with you yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, that I think there's a 70% chance that the, the call has been made. Now, will it be received? Now, what I look at is two things. I've been looking at a bunch of things, a bunch of polling data, and guess what happens? The closer America gets to the election, the more seriously people consider the vote. It's amazing. The closer we get. And in between elections, what do we do? Great we, point, Tom. We stomp our feet. We yeah. scream. Yeah. We have talking heads going yep. back and forth each other. MSNBC, Fox, in a, in a permanent battle back and forth across the border. We're, you know, achieving nothing, just screaming. Now it gets closer. Who shows up? Two months ago, we saw it. All in pod. Chamath. He gave almost the same analysis that Jamie Dimon did. Yep, Remember that, Pat? Did. Yes, he did. He went down. Now, wait a minute, guys. Let's think about this. Let's think about this. I was giving him a D minus because what mainstream media told him, but if you really look at it, it's more like a B plus. Yep. Right. A minus. It, he yep. basically gave in his own way on a grade scale the same thing that and Jamie Dimon did. And he's not Dimon a regular guy. Said. This is a guy that's a billionaire. He's made a lot of good decisions. He's a very smart guy, very connected in the, in the Silicon Valley and, community. And he's only a 50-50 on establishment because his investments are disruptors. So he's really only a 50-50 establishment guy. So the closer it gets here, the more serious that we get. And now we're seeing, and we also have seen the seriousness of the economy, the seriousness of the world stage, the seriousness of several things. And guess what we're saying? Huh, maybe we do need a guy like that. And we've gotten away from the screaming and yelling. That's what I think. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Let's go to the next story. Well, can I... <clears throat> Give 30 seconds because right, well, we're the deal. at 931 the, the, story. The one thing you guys need to know about Trump is what I was trying to say. He's not an ideologue. He's a deal maker. 
The only thing that he's an ideologue about is that America comes first. That's it. But he's willing to have any conversation, any phone call. He'll go to see Kim Jong-un. He'll go see Putin. He'll go see whoever he needs to see to cut a deal. And politics is a numbers game. It's a game of addition, not subtraction. So he's looking for addition. And you want to bring people into your tent. It's called a big tent party. And nobody's pitching a bigger tent than the people on Wall Street these days. So he'll gladly take that money and fix up that phone call. So you think he'll gladly take that money and make that phone call? Okay. I think he will take that phone call. Uh, I think the decisions being made will be very interesting. Anyways, uh, we got we got three other big stories to get. I want to show you this other clip as well. Before, before we do, let's go into this uh, sponsor video here with Masterworks. Go ahead, Rob. Did you see a recent report that came back from UBS talking about the fact that 61% of millionaire collectors put 5 to 30% of their money in contemporary art? The last 27 years, contemporary art has outpaced S&P 500 by 136 percent. I can't afford a Banksy or a Picasso or one of these incredible arts. I'd love to have it, but I can't do it. That's why today's sponsor is Masterworks which means securitization has opened a pathway for the average investor to invest in art directly from your smartphone. Masterworks allows you to buy a share in a multi-million dollar painting and they have $55 million worth of art that they've sold. They now have over 880,000 users and over a billion dollars of assets under management. They've now sold a total of 20 paintings since 2017. Skip the wait list and invest in blue chip art for the very first time by signing up for Masterworks. Go to masterworks.com forward slash PBD podcast. Yeah. Okay. This is all, we're, Rob, we're can not, you hear us or no? You're not dumb, though. All right, by the way, while this, uh, 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 the link's going to be below, by the way, for those of you guys that want to go learn more about uh, Masterworks. Meanwhile, while this was being posted, Vinny was sharing his thoughts a little bit more uh, on the whole uh, Nikki Haley Trump VP situation, but we'll skip that. We'll go to the next one. Okay, Millet goes to, or this is from Argentina, he goes to World Economic Forum. He's invited, and the person that brings him up on stage is Klaus Schwab. And he goes and gives a message. Argentina's Javier Mele says the West is in danger in a fiery Davos speech. If you've not seen the speech, it is 23 minutes. We're not going to play the whole three, 23 minutes for you. But I highly recommend you make a note and you go watch this entire thing. Rob, just play the first minute, minute, 20 seconds. And listen to what he says on how Argentina went from what it was before to what it is today. Go ahead, Rob. I may have to do a sketch about him today, Pat. Just letting you, you know. should. He starts off with 10 seconds. Before. I don't think he speaks English. So it's going to be <laughs> I, an all spend. Well, right? could... Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Today, I'm here to tell you that the Western world is in danger. And it is in danger because those who are supposed to have to defend the values of the West are co-opted by a vision of the world that inexorably leads to socialism and thereby to poverty. Unfortunately, in recent decades, motivated by some well-meaning individuals willing to help others and others motivated by the wish to belong to a privileged caste, the main leaders of the Western world have abandoned the model of freedom for different versions of what we call collectivism. We're here to tell you that collectivist experiments are never the solution to the problems that afflict the citizens of the world. Rather, they are the root cause. Do believe me, no one better place than us, Argentines, to testify to these two points. When we adopted the model of freedom back in 1860, in 35 years we became a leaning world power. And when we embraced collectivism over the course of the last 100 years, we saw how our citizens started to become systematically impoverished and we dropped to spot number 140 globally. But before having the discussion, it would first be important for us to take a look at the data that demonstrate why free and right here. Anyways, he, you know, it's kind of tough to look. There's also a different version that's only English speaking where you don't hear uh, the two different languages. By the way, he goes flat out calling out everybody for 23 minutes straight. Mm -hmm. Damn. 
to their faces. I love that. He calls out the – if you're ever invited to the World Economic Forum to give a speech, and people later on are going to say, well, look at him. He went and spoke at the World Economic Forum. Yeah, but he went and called out yeah. everybody to their faces. This is the way to do it, the way he just did it. Yeah, I love this. And this is something that I've been looking way into these days. What he's basically talking about is something that we're going to be prepared or have to be prepared to face in the next – coming generations, okay? And that is what is called a clash of civilizations. And a clash of civilizations is not about countries. It's about ideas and it's about cultures. And what we're seeing is an East versus West culture clash. So on one hand, you have democracy, you have capitalism, you have freedoms, you have free markets, you have human rights, you have builders, you have creators, you have discussions, open expression. And on the other hand, you have what he called collectivism. You have the Marxists, you have the communists, you have the authoritarian, you have the jihadists, you have the extremists, you have people that want to tear down and destroy. And what he's doing is saying, listen, World Economic Forum, listen, world, there's a clash of civilizations coming. Pick your team. And here in America, we know what team we're on. I, I, Tom, did you hear the speech or no? No, I've, I've, I've read the summary of it, and, and I saw, saw this live here, but I have not read the thing all the way. But I know the code words he's speaking with. And when he says collectivism, he's talking about communism because mm -hmm. he specifically says socialism. And now he says collectivism. Collectivism is communism. Communism with a gun is Marxism. So what he's saying is, look— if two people have, you know, um, Vinny and I are sitting here and I have an orange and you tell me chop half and give it to him. We both have half an orange, but that's all we can have. There's no way to grow more oranges. You've just taken half of mine because you're not supporting capitalism or growth. And collectivism results in everybody impoverished because unless you're the size of the United States with the monetary power that we have, your currency goes down in value. So guess what? You impoverish your entire nation by trying to give everybody some, but something, destroying the incentive to work. You destroy the growth of your of your country and the value of your currency so it all goes down and we're impoverished that's what he said in those first five minutes you know what else he says in a speech he says in a speech that just because a business fails doesn't mean capitalism doesn't work right just because you fail as an entrepreneur doesn't mean capitalism doesn't work this concept about every time a business fails or doesn't work oh this whole thing doesn't work we have to change the entire system no that's not the case here four basic principles of capitalism that we have to keep talking about freedom to buy freedom to sell freedom to try freedom to fail you're going to fail at times the message was so beautiful and he used data he used history he used examples it was the most uncomfortable speech to listen to if you believe in socialism and communism my, my, my question is like they knew that he was going to do this i mean you know you know where he stands if you watched any videos of this guy you know exactly where he stands. Why would they invite this guy to come there and Klaus Schwab bring him on stage if it's going against their narrative? I, I, I don't know I'm why. Very, Great question, I'm, but I, like, I actually I, want to applaud them I love for it. giving a diverse I, opinion of voices. 1,000% when you just thought Klaus Schwab couldn't get more evil. Like The fact that they let this guy go up mm -hmm. there and speak, I think that's that's fantastic because they knew what they were going to get. Tom, right? I, I have an idea for you, Tom. Look at, look at the other way. They couldn't not invite him. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah, like, point. How do you not? Tom, yeah. here's something that I think that you should do over the next coming months or years. This guy's going to be the perfect case example if he can turn Argentina around. The first libertarian that's ever been elected, certainly in Argentina, possibly in the world, libertarian No, no, candidate. he's the first libertarian president ever. Okay, that's ever. what I'm saying. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So we see what's going on in, down in Argentina. Their currency is deflated, unemployment, skyrocket, everything. It's a mess. It's an absolute mess. It's a, back in the day, you know, how do many, whatever many years ago, Argentina, Buenos Aires used to be the Paris of, of Latin America. What are they now? They're a laughing stock. But it took this guy to come in and say, afuera. Afuera. He's not going to happen on my watch. Yeah. So let's see if he can actually turn this country around. Because if he does, he deserves all the praise in the world. Yeah, I'm excited about seeing what's going to happen here. But more importantly, calling out BS. More and more people calling out BS is a beautiful thing that's taking place to the world. Vinny, so NAC, natural yeah. asset companies. This is something that they were talking about at World Economic Forum. What can you tell us about NAC? So uh, I got a message from uh, a guy that's out sick and dope, uh, Menectes. He was like, Vinny, you guys need to talk about this. Nobody is talking about it. I, you know, I want to have this farmland. He I messages wanna... you on Menect. He messages me okay. on Menect. And today, apparently, I think today is the, the last day that you can actually go out there on the public record and try to fight, uh, fight this thing. So I'm going to go really fast. Uh, 
Uh, his name is Reginald. Let me find this guy really, really quick. Give me two seconds. Uh, Reggie. Okay, here he goes. So he, he, he messages me and says, Vinny, I'm sending you this in, that, uh, in regarding something about called natural asset companies. We have a chance to leave a public comment opposing the monetiz- monetiz- uh, monetizing of natural resources. It ends tomorrow, which is today. So this, this thing allows everything from the land, the air, animals, plants, minerals to be traded on the N- uh, New York City Stock Exchange and monetize, creating uh, something called assets class of billionaire oligarchs and he's he's concerned because you know his kids you know he wants his kids to be able to hunt and do the stuff on the land so um it's connected it's connected to the world economic forum it's a desire to, uh, to create this class uh gobbling up our public lands and waterways an opportunity for public comment and today's the last day and i'll, I'll send rob the link uh but there's a new uh phrase called ecocide I don't know if you've heard this or side, eco side, which is actually a legal side, which is allowing unelected elites to tell farmers to stop farming. I mean, this is their goal. We know what they're doing. We know what China's buying up all this land. Bill Gates is one of these. What? One of the- let's let's stay on that. So okay. Let, yeah. Let's let's define so, eco side. So eco side, it's 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 letting. Uh, f- t- they want farmers to stop farming, fishers to stop fishing, miners to stop mining. And when you allow those things to happen, this is what you starve and unrest starts to happen. And the so- uh, society starts to collapse. I have a video I sent Rob, uh, Greta Th- Thunberg and her friend, uh, the CEO of Stop Ecoside International. Her name is Jojo Meta, demanded during the World Economic Forum on Tuesday uh, that they dubbed Where Nature Meets Conflict on Tuesday. It's a new international criminal category of ecocide to prevent the mass damage. So they don't want you fishing. They don't want you doing anything. And they want people to be able to trade and invest on your land, even if you own it. And this is what her attitude, this is just her attitude on fishing and stuff. Uh, this is at World Economic Forum. This is at World Forum. Economic Forum. Okay, go ahead. I mean, ecocide as a word is becoming more, it's becoming better known around the world. And the concept is generally mass damage and destruction of nature. Um, but legally speaking, um, what our organisation and other collaborators aim to do is to have this recognised legally as a serious crime. Because one of the issues that sort of pervades all oh of this discussion God. is that crazy? Is that we have a kind of cultural, very ingrained habit of not taking damage to nature as seriously as we take damage to people and property. Um, and that, I mean, you know, if you're campaigning for human rights, at least you know mass murder, torture, all of these things are serious crimes. But there's no equivalent in the environmental space. Um, and so, and, and you know, unlike a, an international crime like genocide that in, involves a specific intent, with ecocide, what we see is actually what people are trying to do, what businesses are trying to do, is make money, is you know, is farm, is fish, is do all of these things that are um, you know producing energy and so on, um, as well. But what's it, what's missing is the awareness and the conscience around the side effects, around the collateral damage that happens with that. Yeah, f- fishing, fishing and stuff on your own land. They want to, and so Robert, Robert sent me this. So basically, they can rule private property laws under the guise of protecting the environment. They can basically control, and the, dude, they're going to be trading air. Do you understand, like air, water? Tom, land. what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I think this needs to shake out a little bit. There's a little bit of an inflammatory speech going on both sides. But what you basically have is the Greens are trying to find more ways to impose their will. And if the EPA won't do it fast enough, if the Paris Accords won't do it fast enough, they're trying to find other ways to do it. And what you heard her say is she was equating, and basically what she's talking about is Strip mining, where you go for coal and you dig those big pits with all the levels on them Mm -hmm. that you can see, which are pretty devastating, right? Because a lot of that runoff ends up in streams, which is bad. So there's something that's bad. She's trying to equate that with genocide and to put a criminal penalty on it. That's her. That's one of that's one of those angles. And so they're trying to find new ways to invoke an environmentalist and a green agenda is what they're trying to do. And we should learn about this, understand it has a little bit of traction, but also has a hell of a lot of resistance right now. And the resistance is correct. And I sent Rob, I sent Rob the link for people to get on the sec.gov to, to file your, 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 your grievance and say, no, they need comments to make this not happen because this is horrible. If this goes through, it's not going to be good. Uh, Adam. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm, this is the first I'm hearing this. So respect yeah. to you at this. Here's what I will know, and I'll give a shout out to our friend Constantine Kissin from Trigonometry. I remember when he got up in there in Oxford and lectured the global 
uh, disaster, the climate crisis crowd who basically think the world is coming to an end. He said, listen, you have to understand, here in the UK, we have the luxury of having such a great life that we can worry about all the problems that don't ex actually exist right now. But everything that's going on in the climate, it's going to be solved, if it ever is, in the poor countries. In the, in the highly populated core, poor countries like China, India, Latin America, Brazil, because they're putting out the biggest forms of uh, pollution in the world. But you think that a poor Indian is waking up living in the slums of Mumbai and being like, huh, that global warming thing. Dude, they're trying to survive. Yep. Okay, so the poor people are the people that are going to suffer the most by, by this type of agenda. So they're looking at how to pay the rent, basically put some food on the table, and you're living in your high-rise in New York or London worried about the existential crisis that doesn't really exist. So it's all about perspective. People like to put all these pictures out there <clears throat> of all the negative that's happened. I saw a very short documentary on Chernobyl. And so Chernobyl, a terrible econ economic disaster for the city and for the people and a human disaster and then just a, an environmental disaster. But you know what they look back 20 years after Chernobyl? Mm, you mm, know what happened there? Mm. They took satellite pictures and looked. The vegetation and things that had grown back over it was amazing. Mm. So it shows that earth and trees and shrubs and everything that was there with whatever rainfall it gets, it grew back and it was this massive, like, like little micro forest that had grown mm -hmm. in after, after, in other words, after man left, all this stuff grew and they still had this horrible thing in the middle. It's radioactive. Yes, true. But you also know that the earth heals itself pretty quick. Everything grew back. And they said, all this vegetation here is creating a whole lot of oxygen and we still have this ice sorts in the middle, but so all of this thing, they only want to show one side. You know, we stripped mine and we did all this. They don't want to show replanting all the trees. They don't want to show that if you leave it alone for 20 years, that all of a sudden you get the equivalent of forest that grows back. What, what was this documentary called? It was, it was about Chernobyl. It was short. It was about 10 minutes long. Very I interesting. Think, I think some of these are yeah. the pictures that you see of Chernobyl where you see incredible growth. Now, that doesn't change the fact in the middle of it is this little radioactive pit. Yeah. But it does show oh. you how that if we don't keep cutting the trees down the trees grow back if we don't cut the brush down the brush grows back the the, the earth best thing you said is the earth finds a way to heal yes. itself that's why it's called mother nature yeah because women grow life oh my gosh what okay beautiful. we all have mothers okay. here guys you can find his profile on tinder he's yes. in swipe right he's no, single no. right now. okay all right, let's, let's keep going all right so rob can you before we get into the story with nikki haley can you pull up the cj stroud uh post-game victory speech so here it is and by the way the complex sports is showing this on Instagram, and when you go right, go go on the. Uh, they're going to show you both of them. Go one more, Rob. Uh, uh, that's the one. Okay, so if you can pause right there, you're going to hear the edited version of his post game speech by ABC, and then you're going to hear exactly what he says the original version. Go ahead, Rob. Season and a record-setting performance for you. What does this moment mean? I mean, it's been amazing being in this city for as short as I've been, but. Season. They took out, they literally what, edited. What are you worried about, ABC? Yeah. What, 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 NBC has come under fire. I'm sorry, it's NBC, correct? NBC. What are you worried about, NBC? Wow. And, and by the way, who told you to edit that? Is this an editor that edited it because you didn't know anything about it, so they did it? Or did somebody have to prove the fact that you have to cut that out? Or did the boss at the top say cut that out? Or did somebody that you're getting money from saying there's no way in the world we're going to let the clips about you? Who? I just want to know who said cut that? That's all I care about. It, Who? It, it, because what yeah. if he says, I want to thank uh, Allah? Yeah, I don't Muhammad. care. Yeah. Muhammad, I want to thank Muhammad. Go you, for you it. You think they're going to cut that? No, no, but, but that's not the point, though. I want to thank whoever you want to thank. Go for it. You want to cut this out? Isn't that crazy? Is it, is it, is, and by Tim way, Tebow used to say that all the time, well, and they didn't edit it. Very and, weird. And isn't it a weird, uh, because we, we don't know, we'll never know, but I'm telling you right now, and I've been feeling this a lot, and I'm getting a crazy amount of messages on my neck about stuff like this. It's like, they're slowly, they, them, the top, all NBC, from Sony, from all these, all these artists, all these people, they're taking away God out of everything, Pat, because they want, because if... There's no God. You can do whatever you want. You can feel free. If you've been, if you guys have been paying attention to any of these artists, the the Taylor Swifts, the Billie Eilish, the Little Nas X just made another video called Jay Christ, where he is mocking 
Jesus Christ, the entire video, okay? He's on a cross. He's, he's walking flamboyant, showing off his nakedness. He has a, a, a thing on his neck that says sex, but he has the, the, the rosaries in his hand. And he comes out and makes an apology. He's like, listen, this isn't an apology. He literally says this is an apology. I'm just, it's just art. It's just art. No, no. They're mocking God. They're taking away God. For somebody to edit out the guy that's giving out uh, no, Jesus Christ, no, no, they don't want a you. He's a clown. He's a clown, but guess what? He has sold his soul <clears throat> just like the rest yeah, of them. Back, I think it's to, disgusting. I appreciate that, but back to M M NBC. There are forces and editors and producers at NBC. I'm unsurprised by this. Look, Why am I unsurprised? Because you saw Rachel Maddow, d you know, Rob, don't dissing. You know yeah. dissing, you know, white Christians saying the problem in Iowa is all these white Christians with their agenda. Look at the talking points that are allowed to prevail on MSNBC. And this is NBC Sports. Inside NBC, there is an anti-Christian point of view, and they are editing it. It makes it unsurprising to me when I see it. I'm annoyed, but it's unsurprising for me to see it because you can see it coming out in many of their programming angles. So can I ask you a question, Tom? Because it's NBC it's sown. It's all the artists. It's all the stuff that people consume. My question is, why? Why, why the push on such an anti-religion? Just, just the guy's thinking Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know if you guys know who Jesus Christ was. The cool guy that came here and said, hey, everybody love each other, and they murdered him. What, why, why such a push of, of talking about this positive person? But people are going to say things. This is going to pop up in the, in the comments. I don't I'm, I'm going to say it. Listen, you know. You believe there's a creator. You believe there's a Lord. You believe there's a savior. There is an equal, there's not an equal, but there is an opposite force out there and there's the forces of evil and it's real. It's real. You look at the eyes of a lot of people and you can see people say, oh, look at that guy. He just looks evil. It creeps me out. That's real. You're having a spiritual response to reality what's there. And so it does not surprise me that people without an anchor will let their personal boat drift and then be saying things, calling it art and acting in this way and editing out things things that they, they think they don't agree with. And so, look, man, you know, you're, you're messing with the guy that invented lightning. You know? By the way, let me, <laughs> let, let, me, let me tell you what I saw the other day to, to counter all this mess. Michael Porter, you know who Michael Porter Jr. is, basketball player, good player. Yeah, he's Denver got, Nuggets. Yeah, Denver Nuggets. Wow. He's got hops. He's good. He's very exciting to watch. He's doing a podcast with this girl. If you can type in Michael Porter human trafficking, and just go to images. I just looked at the YouTube. The only thing they have is like the 48-minute version. I don't have 48 minutes to go through it. But I watched a short clip of it the other day. That's the one right there. Zoom into that one right there, that image. So he's sitting there with this girl, okay, attractive girl. She's, she's talking to him about human trafficking and what happened, okay? Mm -hmm. At the end of the interview, you know what he says? What? He says, would it be okay with you if I invited you to church? She says, the last time I went to church, I was 12 years old. He says, I told him, would you go to church with me? He says, yes. And he says, would it be okay with you if I prayed for you? Wow. He says, yeah, I guess. He gives the best prayer, really? man. It was so awesome. I wanna, now I want to ask you. I wish you, if, Rob, if you can find it, I would love to sh show the prayer. He prays over he her? He prays wow. over her, you know, that, you know, this isn't her fault, God. Please come give her this to, to understand she didn't do anything wrong. It's not her fault when she was human trafficked. And he invites her to go to church. That's wow. Great. How awesome is that? You know, for, so there's stories like this when you're saying, you know, they want to take uh, Jesus out or they want to take God out. They're not going to win because the NBA is filled. Is this the one? Uh, 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 yeah, this is the one. Watch this. Can you just – I'm so glad oh, you no, found it, Oh, no, I love it, Rob. Watch Let's this. Go, if you baby. can get the audio. Yeah, there you go. Go ahead and play the clip. It's just one minute long. Look what he says. If I could pray for you, and then I wanted to invite you to church on Sunday because you said you haven't been to church for a while. I haven't been to church since I was like 12. 12 years old. So let's go Sunday. <laughs> um, um, so, so, yeah, if, good if you're good, God. I just wanted to end this podcast. Just praying Listen. for you, though. Yeah, that's totally fine. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for Kat. I want to thank you. Um, just the woman she is, Lord. And I just want to thank you for the healing that you've brought about in her life and giving her the, the vulnerability and the courage to share her story. Um, just thank you for, for the woman she is. I ask that you make yourself real to her. Um, heal her in ways that she didn't even know was possible. Um, show yourself to her. Make her whole. Um, give her complete confidence and wholeness in herself. And just help her realize that the things that happen to her are not her fault. Um, there is no shame. There is no guilt there. You, you take that all on yourself. And just please show her that. Uh, we love you and we appreciate you. 
And we thank you that even though terrible things happen to, to all of us, that you somehow can turn that into a beautiful story. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Good for you, Michael wow. Porter Jr. Wow. Does that not give you the chills, Tom? <laughs> I was holding back tears. More than chills. <sighs> Wow. More than children. Wow. By, the, by the way, the, 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 the sport is filled. All the sports are filled with guys like this, man. What They're, a moment. What a moment, right? It also shows you the power of light over darkness. Ah, the, well, light has infinite power over darkness. Power you, to just, see. you just have to be able to see it. And people, and people of power don't want you to see stuff like that, and that's why they edit out videos because tell me, what a, what a great gesture, what a great thing. You felt it, she felt it, and that, dude, that changes that, changes that moment, your, your day, your life, like that. That's such a powerful thing, and for them to Shout try. out to C.J. Stroud and Michael Porter yeah. Jr. God Respect bless you guys. guys. Keep at it. We see you. Let me give you a little perspective. C.J. Stroud, okay? Praying, Jesus. What day of the week do you think that was on, that game? Sunday. It was on Sunday, yeah. right? Yeah. Make no mistake about it. The NFL is competing with Jesus. Good point. There's many people out there who pick sitting at home, watching football, whether they went out on Saturday night or not, that they are not waking up and going to church. There's been a shift in this country. We've talked about this in the lack of values that are declining in America today, whether it's religion, whether it's culture, whether it's community, uh, whether it's community service, whatever the things are, the morals, morals are declining in this country. The only moral that has basically stayed the same is what? Money. So the NFL is competing directly or indirectly with God. There's been a clash of civilizations that we talked about, and it's it's money over God. Great point. So you have someone over like CJ Shout saying, listen, bro, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That should never be edited whatsoever in America. We believe on freedom of speech. We're founded on Judeo-Christian values. It is what it is. But as people stop going to church, stop going to temples, stop praying, yeah. stop going to a mosque, whatever it is, they're going to fall into some sort of ideology. And that's what we've seen the young people, the TikTok gen, the Gen Z generation, praying to President Xi of China yeah. of TikTok to basically fulfill their ideology, whether it's wokeism, whether it's ID, uh, LBG, LGBTQ+, plus plus whatever. AI, Can't even see how many trades, stuff they got yeah. going on. And I'll give you one quick story. I played college football. I played in North Carolina, and then I transferred to Florida State. I was the only Jew on the team. There were 100 people on the team. At the end of every practice, we all huddled up, and the coach, all right, all right, guys, huddle up now. Coach Kirby right here. All right, everybody, uh, bow your head, and he would give a prayer. Guys, uh, you know, uh, protect us, Lord, blah, 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 everything. Yeah. In Jesus' name we pray. And I'm sitting there like, okay. It's all good. Cool. I, as a Jew, I don't have to – I'm just closing my eyes, praying for the team. We're so easily offended in this country. If I didn't ever go to the AD and say, I'm Jewish, I can't – dude, I shut the fuck up and I pray. Yeah. So for for the country to not – for was it NBC? NBC. To edit this out, and I'm sure they'll give – well, it was a one-off time, one editor, yeah. you know, I'm sure whatever. But there's clearly something going on in this country pushing God and religion and what's right out of our lives yep. – and whatever else that's bad into our lives, they're certainly not going to take Little Nas X's devil dancing video <laughs> yeah. off the table. Nope. I, promote it. So, again, shout out to CJ and to oh, Porter. Porter. Good for Amazing. you guys. Uh, let's go to the next story here. All right, next story. Uh, Red Sea risk to oil, very mm -hmm. real. Prices could change rapidly if supply disrupted. Chevron CEO says, let me read this, and then, Tom, I'm coming to you. So here we go. The crisis in the Red Sea poses a serious risk to oil flows and prices could change quickly if tensions lead to a major supply disruption. The Middle East Chevron CEO Michael Worth told CNBC on Tuesday, it's a very serious situation and seems to be getting worse. Worth said in an interview to, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the Chevron CEO said he was surprised that the U.S. crude oil was trading below $73 a barrel because the risk was very real. So much of the world's oil flows through the region that were uh, uh, that were it to be cut off, I think you could see things change very rapidly. And uh, he continues, the, we really have to watch this very, very carefully. Tom, what does this really mean to the average person? <clears throat> okay. The CEO of Chevron is saying that if the supply goes down and we're all still demanding, you know, we still have demand for consumers and countries to, you know, to have oil for energy and all the things that, that it creates, aviation, gas, diesel fuel, you know, gasoline for your car, the whole thing. What he's saying is that 
if supply is disrupted, prices are going to go up. But there's something most Americans don't know. And Rob, let's pull a couple charts here really, really quick. First of all, you have the U.S. facts chart. I sent you a link, U.S. facts. Uh, um, and then go down the, to the little chart down there. No, 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 U.S. facts. I said there was three links in the email. One of them is just called from U.S. facts. Uh, there we go. Go down the bottom. The United States became energy independent in 2020. In other words, we produce more crude oil than we used in 2020, and there's been no turning back, no turning back whatsoever. And so what he's talking about is the supply and demand. He's saying, I'm surprised U.S. crude is below 73 a barrel because if the supply goes down because of you know the Red Sea and the Houthis and you can't get shipping around, he would expect the price would go up because there's less oil going around and it's more valuable. And so that's the point he's making. And here in the United States, the uh, oil companies pre-price gasoline. So if they think that the world market is going up for the oil, Oil, they charge us that price for barrel of oil. They don't charge us like a home team discount for the oil. So people think that, oh, gas goes up in the United States because we can't get oil from the Middle East. It'll be terrible. Won't be able to drive our car. That's wrong. Last year, the oil. The, the total oil wells in America that were pumping, they shut off 35% of them because they were trying to move the price back up to the mm. uh, above 55 yep. because they needed to be above 55 to make it economical for oil here. But check that out. There it is. And then two other real quick is you, you'll, you'll love this. <clears throat> so we produce more than we use. So we're, we've been a net exporter and on the spot market, our actually biggest trading partner is Canada. Mm. And so people don't seem to understand what they're talking about. So, and you get back to it. And when they pre-raise prices, that's when states like California had hearings on this. You're gouging. You think the price of oil is going to go up. So you raise it and they go, yeah, sure we did. Right. You know, Exxon made uh, go back to 2022, Exxon was $56 billion in profit, Chevron was $35 billion in profit, and we were ready to burn them at the stake and execute them because they pre-priced where the oil was going to go. Well, meanwhile, Amazon made $225 billion in profit, and we didn't talk about that, about driving small you know, community stores, retailers out of business. We didn't seem worried about that, but we tend to run to this. It's a simple supply and demand thing. The price of oil goes up, the price of oil goes down. And guess what? It affects us here, too. So what Americans should worry about on an international stage is when oil is disrupted in the Middle East, guess what? U.S. companies can sell the oil we pump at a higher price to other people out there than we would sell it to ourselves. And that's why our gas goes up. Mm -hmm. But if World War III breaks out, we have got plenty of oil here in the United States. Drill, baby, drill. So from a macro socioeconomic standpoint, let me tell you why this is important now. Because, listen, when's the first time you were, heard the word Houthi rebels? How long ago? Well, I mean, a couple years ago. Not too long ago. Okay. Most people... Houthi. Have, um, no, 90% of people haven't. Nobody's heard of these people. Yeah. Okay. Like, they, they think it's Houthi and the blowfish, <laughs> if you think about it. Sometimes or, or, they, or they heard the word Somali pirate. Yeah, now exactly. they know who it is. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that Somalia is a totally different country than Yemen. The Houthis are in Yemen. But here's the point. Yeah, the Houthis aim to govern Yemen and support external forces against the United States, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. So what's my point is there? There's been a civil war in Yemen. Pay attention to the jihadists over here. Pay attention to the Gaza Brigade. There's been a civil war in Yemen since 2014. Nobody talks about this. They don't. Saudi Arabia and Iran are having a proxy war. For the last decade, millions of people in this country of Yemen have died. You don't hear about this. Where's the Gaza Brigade here talking about the innocent Arabs that are dying? And they should. And it's horrible. But the reality is, is once they start, when Israel gets involved and all of a sudden these, um, these regional conflicts pop up and Iran starts basically funding the Houthis and Hamas and Hezbollah, terrorist organizations, Iran is basically the greatest destabilizing force in the Middle East, possibly in the world, other than China. All of a sudden, America is going to take notice because you know what America don't play with, and you know what the E don't play with, you know what the UK don't play with? Their money. This right here, what country did we learn, or what, what the Horn of Africa, the one city that China has a base? Djibouti. Djibouti. And it's fun to say, and you know, I like that. I want to get to you uh, in Djibouti. And Djibouti. <laughs> but the reality is this this Red Sea, this shipping area, is one of the 
most busy ports uh, seas in the world. And the Houthi rebels are messing with people's money. Big time. And when you start messing with people's money, you start messing with trade routes, all of a sudden, we don't play that game right there. So that what they're doing, the Houthis, to bring up Tom's point, they make the Somali pirates of I am the captain now, Tom Hanks, they make them look like the JV squad to echo what Os- Os- uh, Obama said. Obama, about, uh, Osama bin Obama. Osama bin Obama about ISIS right there. But these Houthi rebels, again, funded by Iran, funding by the mafia-like regime that's going on in Iran, are looking to sow chaos. And in the world of 2024, we know that the the word this year is chaos. U.S. represents order in a world of chaos in the Red Sea. Meanwhile, Bernie Sanders says to uh, force vote to freeze aid to Israel, and U.S. puts Houthis back on the terrorist list. This is a story from Wall Street Journal. The Biden administration plans to put Houthi rebel group on uh, one of its uh, list of terrorist organizations days after the U.S. launched strikes on its facilities in Yemen in retaliation for months of attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. About time we're doing this. The designation bars people or companies in the U.S. from offering just about any kind of support to the group and prohibits its members from entering the U.S. It also requires U.S. financial institutions to freeze any funds they hold belonging to the group or under its Control And U.S. obviously recently carried out additional strikes against Houthis in Yemen while this is taking place. Adam, thoughts on this story? Yeah, well, it just proves uh, more and more and more that Bernie Sanders is a loser. Everybody knows it. So it's becoming clearer and clearer that the guy has never built anything in his life. And we talked about Bernie Sanders here. All the socialists want to do, the Democratic socialists, is tear down. They've never built anything. What has Bernie Sanders ever done? He's a career professional loser. Professional he loses. Politician. He likes to lose. He's done nothing. Yep. And he's basically spoiled milk at this point. So he's out there. Whatever his stance are, I think we've realized there's no math. There's no numbers behind any of his opinions. You know, he used to basically uh, stomp and raid and talk trash about millionaires. Then he became a millionaire. Then it, then it moved to billionaires, yeah. right? How many times yeah. did he say millionaire, millionaire, the millionaires and the millionaires. Now it's the millionaires and the billionaires. Yeah. Now it's the billionaires. You're talking about somebody. So and th- this whole concept of intersectionality, right, of anyone who's oppressed has to identify with people who are oppressed around the world. Constantine Kissens, the second time I've mentioned his name, he's trigonometry. He went in the U.K. and he went to the people who are marching for Gaza, okay, and, and what's going on there is horrible, and nobody wants to see innocent civilian lives, period. Whether it's on the Israeli side, whether it's on the Gazan side, whether it's what's going on in Iran and uh, Pakistan these days. If you see that that's a little, whether it's going on in Yemen, nobody wants to see innocent civilians. But in war, unfortunately, this is sort of the damage, the collateral damage that happens right there. And he started interviewing all these people that are holding signs. And he goes, what's, what's this sign right here? Oh, it's a, we're calling for the socialist intifada. And he starts asking these people, white people in London who are marching. And, and he's yeah. like, what is a socialist intifada? They're like, honestly, dude, I got no clue what's going <laughs> I'm on I'm just here. holding the sign. I got no clue, mate. They just yeah. gave me a sign. I'm out here. I don't yeah. want to see dead I people. And, sign. and what we realize is kind of like how Jamie Dine was saying, ask questions like, why? 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 What's going on here? What he did, and shout out to you, Constantine. I sent you a text. He went, he's like, well, why do you? What's going on here? What does it mean from the river to the sea? What does this mean? What does that mean? They're like, oh, mate, I got no idea. Like, have- I got no clue what's going so on. So are they holding the sun? Exactly. Yeah. So they're just, there's just, they're, what do they call it? Just like useful, useful, useful idiots. idiots out there marching in the real world. And you have some, a useful idiot, real life useful idiot like Bernie Sanders um, who makes some noise. And he's inspired the squad and the AOCs and the Ilhan Omars and the Presleys of the world and the Rashida Talibs, And that's their weird cult leader. But this is someone who has built nothing in his life and only wants to tear something and down. And never, ever, ever trust anybody that combs his hair with a balloon. Have you seen his hair? <laughs> Tom, Bernie Sanders, hey, listen, I want to talk. I just I take a balloon. I, he's, he's, he's a professional loser, period. End but, of story. You know, it's funny. When you look at things now. It's about lip doesn't move when it talks. It's funny. He should have been the one running against Trump. Two populists. Look at that guy. With different messages. Obviously, Hillary, you, guys, you know, did what she needed to do. Look at that guy. But it's hair. become increasingly clearer and clearer, especially since being a part of Valuetainment. Capitalism is the way. 
Capitalism is how you basically lift people out of poverty, and this guy's peddling socialism, democratic socialism, but at the end of the day, it's all nonsense. And like Tom's analogy about splitting the orange, you only have one orange, and if you chop it up in half, you're going to get some, you're not going to get some. you got to create more Tom oranges. I thought was going somewhere else when he brought up the orange. I, I thought he was talking about like... You know, additional source of income for for Vinny and I. I or thought vitamin C. Creative, I don't know what the hell, but, but you know, thank you for sharing. It was slightly sharing, offensive, but, but yeah. I didn't know what he was. I, I, I really want to get your opinion on this because you actually, I know you're no fan of Bernie Sanders, but you've given him credit because he is a true believer. Oh, listen, I. You know why uh, uh, AOC? You know, a perfect story with AOC. AOC is unbelievable at what she does. Driver, salesperson of if if you have AOC on your side, whatever the ideas she supports, she's going to be the loudest person selling those ideas. You don't have to agree with the ideas. Mm -hmm. You wish you had an AOC on your side. AOC is the kind of person you want. Same with Bernie. You know, you, you, again, don't agree with the ideas. Don't agree with his approach. Don't agree with 90% of the stuff that he talks about. Every once in a while, he does say some stuff where you're like, okay, okay. this kind of does make sense. But you know what the guy's been? He's such a true believer and a believer of, you know, communism or socialism. The guy went on his honeymoon to freaking Russia. <laughs> That's crazy. D Unbelievable. And not, not during the current Russia. <laughs> yeah. We're talking like USSR, like USSR Bolshevik Russia. Revolution Russia. You realize, Russia. like, where do you want to, can you imagine, like, somebody right now says, where do you want to go for uh, your honeymoon? <clears throat> the guy says, Dude, for sure we're going to uh, we're going to Gaza because uh, th that's where we're going for a honeymoon. We're going to go to Iran for a honeymoon. We're going to go hang out in Syria yeah. with Bashar al-Assad. That's where and, we're going to enjoy go. all the laps of luxuries that Whoever are going that on there. Says that, they're true believers. So this guy's a true believer. I just don't uh, uh, think he's got way too many contradictions in his arguments. Okay, Tom, California data's come out out of top fifty states that have lost the most people in twenty twenty three. The ones that gained the most number one is Florida, number two is Texas, number three is Tennessee. The ones who have lost the most at the 50th spot is California, 49 is New York, and I want to say 48 is Illinois. What data do you have with how bad and ugly things are with money in regards to California? Uh, this, this is wonderful. This is where... You know, that it all comes home to roost. So we hear about, oh, you know, the, the number one salesman of the year for U-Haul is Gavin Newsom, you know, our star salesman. And we hear about the people moving back and forth and all that. Let's talk about AGI. What's AGI? Adjusted gross, gross income. income. So in other words, the total income that the state loses and the total income that the state gains. Yeah. California lost in 36 months. 23? 22, 21, 29 billion dollars of AGI left the state. That with a is, B. With a B. Billion. With a B. Calif Florida, like Vanessa with a B. Florida received 39 billion dollars of AGI coming in. By the way, the rest of the top 10 recipients received 38 billion. So Florida at number one had more AGI come in than the next nine. Wow. Damn. That were on the plus list, which wow. includes Texas and Tennessee, Tennessee just like you're talking about. Now, Damn. the next thing I went and, and did say, so so if California lost $38 billion, what'd they lose? So let's say point one, nobody pays taxes to California, and the average tax to Californians average, remember their tax is 13.3%, but the average paid is about 7.5%. So you take 7.5% of this, and suddenly you get $2.1 billion in income tax that Sacramento did not receive because the people left. The second thing is you take about 30% um, of that, you send it to the federal government because they have to pay mm -hmm, tax to the federal mm -hmm. government. And you're left with a net savings rate in California of like 5%. So in other words, the remaining it leaves you $20 billion that they didn't pay sales tax on. So 20 billion times 7% in California is another 1.4 billion. So the states and cities missed $4 billion, and then the rest of the state, that $20 billion didn't buy anything. Haircuts at Supercut, bought a car from the car dealership, it bought nothing. It didn't buy energy. It didn't buy anything. So California's net loss of, of all of that was $20 billion in commerce that people didn't spend, and up to $5 billion that never made it to Sacramento or the communities. Florida... That $39 billion, when you do the same math, it was $5 billion that was received by 
the governments of Florida, because there's no income tax, just in sales tax and minor tax that's also on gas. And then it brought, do the same math, you send uh, 25% to the federal government, it leaves almost $30 billion in new commerce, buying and selling stuff mm. to wow. the people here. So when you hear about the population going back and forth, there's where it comes home to roost. Gavin Newsom, where are you going to find the $5 billion in tax receipts for you and the local counties that collect the uh, sales tax? Where are you going to find it, dude? Where are you going to find it? Tom, let me ask you a question. So do you remember? That's back, real. Yeah, do you remember back in the days Governor Perry would come to Texas and say, "Hey, if you're a small business owner and they're not taking care of you here and you're paying all this money in taxes, come to Texas, come to California." You come mean. to Texas? No, no. He was saying, "Come to." No, Texas. He went to California to he give went to speeches. California, exactly. going on all the radio shows, recruiting mm-hmm. small businesses to go to Texas. Yeah. So you and I were at an in conference in Arizona. And there we met a mayor, Mayor Masso, right, who was from Frisco. And he was a two- or three-term mayor of Frisco. He took a city of 5,000 people. Uh, can you type in Frisco population? Type in Frisco population today. It's got to be 109. Oh, it was 149,000 when we lived there? Holy shit. It's at 211,000 in 2021. Look at that growth since no, it's insane. They wow. went from 5,000 to 200,000 in less than 30 years. But they did, it, they did it the right way. They, they bought schools, infrastructure. Vinny, there was nothing yeah. in Frisco. And you lived right there in Plano, I want to say. But we were in Frisco there. every weekend. Every weekend we were at Frisco to go to that mall. And look at it. Frisco's about to pass up Plano. You see how Plano's flatline? Oh, yeah, Frisco's yeah. not flatline. It's going to keep growing. They're so, serious, so we go there, and Governor Perry is recruiting businesses away from California. And you know what Perry did? Perry got us thinking. Perry mm. got a lot of people in Texas thinking, why am I paying for this? So one day I get a knock on a door. You remember this? Woodland Hills office. Guy knocks on the door. And he says, yeah, um, we're here to see Patrick Bay David. Uh, what for? Yeah, where do you see you? Yeah, this is a, we're here to collect county tax. County tax? What? Yes. What do you mean county tax? Yeah, you owe county tax. How do you know what I owe county tax? I pay my state and my federal. Yeah, but there are some counties in L.A. you got to pay. And the county you're in, you, and how much do I have to pay you? They give me some number. I don't know what the number was, like $80,000, $70,000. I'm like, what? Yeah, so I call my accountant. I say, hey, what is this all about? They said, well, it's hit and miss. If you're public and they not publicly traded, but if your company's growing and the public knows about it, they come knocking on your door and collect the money. And if they find you, you have to pay for it. I said, you got, is this, is it your, I said, no, you got to pay for it. So we pay for it. Then I learned California has 11 or 13 counties you can go to where there is no county tax. Victorville, Valencia, whatever. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying Valencia is a county, but there's 13 cities. M- municipalities. That, yeah. that you don't pay any taxes in, county taxes gotcha. in. Glendale Burbank was one of them, okay? That you don't pay. That you don't pay taxes in. And I, obviously, I was not going to go to Victorville. I don't know if you've been to Victorville. I have Vic- been to Victorville. Victor's a very different kind of situation. Very yeah. weird. So, Did I got Yoshimoto there? No, not Yoshimoto. I no, corrected no, you. I put it on Instagram. Yoshinoya, not Yoshimoto. Yoshinoya. Get it right, Whatever. Buddy. It's still 7-Eleven hot dog. Saw, Did you see the, the racial best. undertones no, right there? Did you see the undertones? Yeah, I totally no, felt it. So Victorville <laughs> looks like Las Vegas before there was Las Vegas there. That's exactly yeah. the way to put it. Yes. <laughs> so 70 years ago. Anyways, moral of the story is what? Moral of the story is we left Woodland Hills and we went to Glendale to avoid county taxes. Why am I paying for this? Then they wouldn't continue with taxes, regulation, all this stuff. And then eventually we moved when Governor Perry started coming and recruiting. We went to Texas for a meeting. And it was Mayor Masso and his camp. They picked us up at the airport. We went and had a good time with them. Then they took us to meet with Nolan Ryan, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Donnie Nelson, the son who, you know, Mavericks. lived, lived in a community Mavericks. in Frisco that we were looking at, beautiful area I love. And then we went and met with Governor Perry. And oh. there were a bunch of CEOs that they were recruiting to the business. Why are you paying? How do you feel about paying the state taxes you're paying in California? You know, you come here. We appreciate you here. How do they look at you when you go there? Don't they look at you as those rich people that make? But in Texas, you're a hero to us. We're yes. going to take care of you. Yeah. And then we get on the car, in the car, we get back on a flight. Everybody's debriefing, like, man, these guys actually appreciate us. Okay. Southern hospitality, respect mm-hmm. this, this, that. What happens? California gradually, there was a Time Magazine article came out. Rob, can you pull this up? It was called the United States of Texas. Hmm. Type in Time Magazine right next to United States of Texas, then type in Time Magazine. Yeah. And go to Images. This is like nine years ago, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I made, There you go. What, what year was it? Can you zoom in a little bit so we can get the date? 
What year was this magazine when it came out? Go to the top. 2013? They put their, 28th of 2013. This is when I started selling Texas to my guys. Moral will remember this. Oh, wow. This is when I would pull this out and say, guys, Texas, Texas, Texas. Two and a half years later, I sold Melva, Moral. Jen didn't want to go to Texas. Nobody wanted to go to Texas. Yeah. This article is the reason what him, this article and Governor Perry is why we ended up in Texas. Okay, so here's the point, Tom. What does Newsom do to attract small business owners to Texas when all the data sucks yep. and doesn't favor him? How do, so be Newsom for a second. Recruit me. I'm a small business owner out of Arizona. Sell me on coming to uh, California. I'm in New Mexico. I'm in Arizona. I'm in Nevada. I'm in Texas. Sell me on why I should move my business to, to California. Point one. It's beautiful. The climate is beautiful. The ocean is beautiful. The coast is beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Point two. I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. Literally, that, what does he have Put left? Put the comedy aside, though. How do you yeah. sell it? I don't know how you, you sell can't. it. You don't have a labor base. They're, le they're, they're, they're largely leaving. It's hard for your people. Now, your people are going to come here to almost two times the uh, housing costs, and our insurance cost is up. But you know what? They got the climate and they got everything here. It is not possible. Article after article is being written. You can't sell the dream. All you can do if you're Gavin Newsom is is, is go snake oil on them. It's overblown. You don't understand that. Yeah. There's lots of and great communities. The we care about like our people. They go to the emotion. They go to the liberal emotion. We care about our people. We care about what's going on. We're working on health care things. We're working on insurance that we just gave to all the uh, illegal aliens at your cost. We're working on that. Yep. They have to go to the emotional argument about it's overblown. They're putting it in a bad light. Come here. Check it out. That's what it is. But there are no, there is no literal, rational PowerPoint that be, can be crafted to get a business from Arizona to, to move to California. We, he, he, we, he, we all saw the, oh, sorry, ben, we all saw the debate between DeSantis and Newsom. Anyone who watched the first hour of the debate, I was like scratching my eyes out. I'm like, DeSantis, you have every piece of data in your favor, and this guy is somehow spinning this, and he's winning this debate. He's a trickster. He's such a dirty little trickster. Now, if I was Governor Perry, dude, I would be able to sell Texas to Californians in 10 seconds. Uh, Tall y'all in San Francisco, move to Frisco. If you don't like taxes... Move to Texas, okay? <laughs> if you don't if like, you don't like the communism, <laughs> yeah. come get some freedom in your life. Yeah. Taxes versus Texas. I see you in Texas. Yeah. Everything's bigger in Texas except for the taxes. And, and by the way, it's so simple. And Tom, well, Tom, it, it, it's simple. And I know we kind of thought he was joking, but you know how many people I talk to in California, just in general, and I'm like, what is going, like, why the hell would you, you made a great point, Tom. You know what a lot of them say? The, the weather's. Like, you can't beat the weather. The lifestyle. People are willing to what sacrifice lifestyle? money and taxes and, and crime and literal, literally crap in the streets, doo-doo in the streets, homeless people everywhere. But they go, you know what? At least it's not, like, humid or sticky mm -hmm. and it doesn't rain that much. It's crazy that weather plays such an important role in their decision perspective, to stay in a shithole. Perspective gives you everything. And when people from California take a trip somewhere or they go to their nephew's wedding in <clears throat> in Nashville and they go, wow, it's kind of, this is like, wow, this is not a bad town. This is not a bad place. How much are you paying for the house here? We pay about this. That's what happens. If you give a citizen true perspective and some facts, they flip. Yeah. And so the thing about California, I know people in California haven't been out of California in eight, ten years. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they're not trapped and they're not impoverished. They just haven't gone anywhere and really experienced it. So they are like the proverbial frog boiled in the pot. Yeah. The last time <clears throat> I went back to California and I get back there somewhat regularly. And I've looked at the San Fernando Valley, you know what I'm about to say, and I drive up the same streets that I used to drive up, and I can see the changes in the walls behind houses, and I can see the changes in the road and the infrastructure, and I go, wow. This was happening while I was lived, the, lived here, and I was the frog being boiled in the pot. Yeah, and you give me perspective somewhere well, you else, jumped. you give me yeah. truth. You the jumped. funny thing is, if, for anybody that's ever lived in California and lived in Texas, it shouldn't even be close. California is so much better than Texas 
on the surface. Of course. Good the call. oceans, the mountains, the lifestyle, the palm trees. Hollywood. Are you kidding me? Hollywood. With the exception yeah. of Addison, Texas, and the and the yard house there that we hung out all the time. Best speech in the world. I don't want no part, no Texas. But let me tell you something. When you look at your paycheck, and if you're making money, and all of a sudden there's an extra 13% to what? get the town out of your paycheck, nope. you say, <laughs> Point, don't forget sign me up, buddy. By the way, check this out. Let, let me give you some stats here. You ready? So we started our headquarters, the insurance company, out of Northridge, California, mm -hmm. okay? At the time, 100% of our agents were from Northridge, California, okay? So so <laughs> this, is, this is pretty wild. Um, Rodolfo and Ceci Vargas, first to, leave tech, uh, first to leave California. They, they lived went in to Palmdale. Houston, right? They went to Houston, Texas. They're killing it, by the Jason way. Jason went to Dallas. You got George went to Austin. Mm -hmm. You got Jose went to Houston. You got literally Del Toro's in they moved. Del to Toro went to San Antonio. Yeah. Do you, do you realize? Five Matt Sapula went from Chicago to uh, Sapula. Matt to, went from yeah. every single one yep. of the board councils moved to the state of Texas. Yeah, all all of them. Every one of them That's moved to the state crazy. of Texas. Yeah, I'm telling you what I just said to you, Ryan. Every one of them moved to the state of Texas, and none of them are from Texas. No. They're all from California or Chicago. Wow. They, they moved to Texas. So this isn't like a you know, thing that's just happening, that small numbers here. This is being affected with a lot of yeah. different businesses and a lot of people different moving. And by the way, speaking of moving, what, quick stat. You've talked about this, why Governor Newsom was the U-Haul Employee of the Year. If you wanted to rent a U-Haul, because you talked about moving, to move from California to go to Texas, it would cost you how much? $3,000? But if you want more, but if you wanted to move from Texas to California, it was yeah. basically free. It was like that. It was like, come on yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. So the numbers just don't add up. All right. So let's go to the next story here. So Strickland, Sean Strickland's being interviewed and this guy asks him a question about trans and, you know, comments was made and nobody has a clue what the answer is going to be. And then Strickland just completely turns it on him, turns on him. And flips it on him, and then afterwards, I'm, I know you got other things to add to it. Well, as well. well you, want, you want to know what what this was in reference that the What's guy, that? the because Sean Strickland said, I think in 2022 or 21, he said, if I had a gay son, uh, I would think I failed as a man to create such weakness. He goes, if I had a, a whore for a daughter, I think she just wanted to be like her dad, and he l l o l. Uh, that 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 was initial comment. So he's in Canada. Uh, go ahead and, and play this. this is what Watch the guy, this here. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, we've got a pretty supportive gay and lesbian yeah. community in this city. I did oh want to ask you about something God. you wrote a couple of years ago. You said, if I had a gay son, I would think I... Oh, look, another... another. I'm saying to you, the swamp, you guys, the swamp. <laughs> you become a champion, you become a star, and, and someone... Let me ask model. you something. Are you, are you, are you gay? Have you had the chance no, to are, interact with are, a more diverse... Are you... Model? Let me know. Are, are you gay? Can I, hear, can I get an answer? Well, no, I'm asking. I'm, this is a part of... Are you, are you a gay man? I'm an ally of the community. An ally? Okay. <laughs> if you had a son, then he was like, you know, you had a son, he was gay. You'd be like, oh, man, you don't, you don't want a grandkid? No problem with it. Oh, man. Well, you, dude, you're a weak fucking man, dude. You're like, you're part of the fucking problem. You elected wow. Justin what? Trudeau. Like, yes. when you fucking, when he sees the bank accounts, like, like you're COVID. just fucking pathetic. And and the fact that, the fact that you have no fucking backbone and, and has he shut down your fucking country and seized bank accounts, you ask me some stupid shit like that, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Move the fuck on, wow. man. That doesn't really coward. answer the question, but I did want to ask also things you said about the trans community. You said uh, this past October when they announced the Bud Light sponsorship that You'd go so hard on Bud Light in your next fight, they'll have to accept me or denounce me when uh, when they know what and they'll we'll know what they stand for. Are you this still guy's like that? Nah, this Canadian is not that Canadian. Are you still going to use your fight time to kind of speak on that? Here's the thing about Bud Light. Here's the thing about Bud Light. Ten years ago, to be trans was a what a mental fucking illness, and now all of a sudden, people like you have fucking weaselled your way in the world. <laughs> you are you are an infection. You are the definition of weakness. Everything that is wrong with the world wow. is because of fucking you. <laughs> and the best thing is, is the world's not buying it. The world's yes. not buying your fucking Shut bullshit. You're fucking peddling. Wow. The world is not saying, you know what? You're right. Fucking chicks have dicks. The world's not saying that. The world's saying, no, there are two genders. I don't want my kids being taught about, you know, who they could fuck in school. I don't want my kids being taught about, you know, their sexual preference. Like, dude, this guy is the fucking enemy. Uh, you want to look at the fucking enemy to our world? It's that motherfucker right there. Wow. Asking wow. me stupid by, fucking questions. By the way, this is two things. 
wears his heart in his sleeves and tells it as I mean, obviously, not the smartest guy in the world, but you know what I respect out of this whole thing too? Have you heard anything from Dana or anybody? The beauty about the UFC mm-hmm. is say what you want to say. You stand on your own two feet. You say what you want. And the fact that he asked that guy, are you gay? And the guy goes, I'm an ally, I'm an ally. of the community. <laughs> what the mean? hell does that mean? Like, I hook up with guys. And then, <laughs> like, but I'm not gay. I just hook up with my boyfriend. But yeah, I'm not gay, yeah, I'm not gay not, but my boyfriend, not that, big of that a gay. guy's gay. Yeah. But, uh, the guy that pounds me, he's, yeah. but what do you, he's the gay one. What do you think about that? When you hear him say, like, stand up for, for what? This guy is talking about how we've evolved. What do you think? This is why UFC is so important. I love that <laughs> UFC is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and Dana doesn't care when they say things like this. And, and, and by the way, check this out. Even with the Bud Light comment that he made, he didn't call out Bud Light because Bud Light is now a ninth bigger yeah. sponsor of the UFC, and this guy's got the audacity to say what he just said right now. Mm-hmm. No, he's right, though. He is right when he's calling out the BS of him sitting there saying, if your son was gay, would you be okay with that? And you'd never be a grandfather? I'm, to- I'm, to- I'm, totally, I'm totally okay with that. Okay. I mean, mo- the, the reason why you have a child is to continue the legacy of your family, and it outlives it. And if your son is gay, you're not going to have a biological child because he can't have a biological child with another man. They have to go adopt. And that's not your biological child. It's a great choice to, you know, for those that choose to adopt. We, we, to those families, salute. We need, we, we need to applaud and respect a lot of those families that do it the right way, right? But he's calling out BS, and I actually respect it. This, by the way, mm-hmm. this, this, this answer could have never been given in the NFL, never in the NBA, never in the MLB, never in the NHL. Nobody in those sports could have given an answer like this except for the great UFC ran by a man named Dana White. Tom, your thoughts when you hear something like this from Sean Strickland? I, I, first of all, I echo what you just said. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. The, the other sports leagues <clears throat> are worried about China, worried about this, worried about that, and they are at the whim of their sponsors. We heard Dana say very clearly he leads the sport, and he is not at the whim of his sponsors, correct? He is absolutely not. He appreciates them. He respects them. They're making the economy come around, but they are not going to tell him what to be or what to do. Whereas the other leagues, the tail wags the dog. That's the way it is in the other leagues. What do you think about what he said, what Sean said? He is pro- he is just projecting out absolutely what his feelings are, and he, there is a point of truth that he said there. He said, 10 years ago, we would have regarded trans as a mental illness, and what he didn't say there, and I'll add to it, is guidance counselor would have been trying to get some counseling if a kid, so if a, if a male comes in and make up an address 10 years ago to um, a high school and wants to you the girl's room, it would have been, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, let's go down, sit down the guidance counselor's office. And let's talk about this. What's going on here? That would have been reaction. Now it's like, wait, wait, wait. He's making his choice. Hang on. <clears throat> He's right. He's right about that. 10 years ago, be that. And we're all getting in the name of acceptance of whatever, the acceptance of whatever, you know, AOW, we are getting this. Mm -hmm. And he's calling it out and going back, and he's dead right on that point. Adam. This is the problem with lumping in the L's, the G's, the P's, the T's, the I's, the A's, the Q's. They're all different type of people. I think what we're all trying to say is, listen, if you're gay, you're gay. Nobody's got a problem. Like, okay, you're gay. You're a lesbian. Do your thing. Are you bi? You're just a little confused. It's the T's. It's the T's where you want me to pretend... That that penis in between your legs is actually a vagina. Okay, Dylan Mulvaney. All right, we're playing this game. Okay, nothing to see here. Yeah. And then there's people just be like, yeah, I don't, I don't think so, bro. Now we're in America. Freedom of choice, freedom of religion, freedom of perspective. Do what you want. Nobody's got a problem. With, but don't make that your. I'm not. I don't walk around. Yo, I fuck chicks, bro. It's what I do. I mean, that's how I identify. I mean, you kind of do. do. <laughs> but that's not how I identify. That's I'm not cool. like call me. Uh, a straight man everywhere I go. It's like, that's not the identity that you're looking for. But if you look at the numbers, I know we're joking. If you look at the numbers, Bill Maher pointed this out. Pat, you can fact correct me. Traditionalists, okay, less than 1% identify as LGBT. Baby boomers, 2%. Gen X, 5%. Millennials, 10%. Gen Z, 19, 20%. 
Listen, in human history, 20% of the population is not gay. You came on my show as a trans woman. You crushed it. It was amazing. You. you said, listen, Saz, trans is the new trend. Yeah. And it is. That's the reality. Is. But here's how, here's how weird it gets. When he called out that guy, he's like, do you want your son to be gay? The guy's like, I have no problem with him. Do you want him to be gay? There's a part of that guy that's like, yeah, I'm actually rooting for that. I think so. I'm, I, I actually want my son to be gay. Yeah. Not, 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 okay, if it happens, it happens. You don't root for that. You're not pushing it. Yeah. But that's what that ally is. It's like, not only would I be uh, happy for it, I'd be proud. I'm rooting for that. It's so, like, for example. No, you're not. Let me say this. Let me say this here. I made a comment to you yesterday, and I'm going to say this publicly so everyone knows what my position is. You said mm -hmm. something to uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, right? Yep. And I gave feedback saying, I don't like us saying stuff about appearance, women. I'm, I, that's not my, uh, what do you it's call not, it? Uh, uh, it's not your thing. No, no. Not your it's, not, it's not because, look... Uh, Everybody has got their own insecurities and all this other stuff. If they attack us, mm -hmm. hey, let's roll. I'm totally okay with that. Let's have fun with that. But I don't want to go play that part, right? It's just not part of who we are, not our brand. Not, not, it's just not, not what we represent. You, you always take the feedback, and it's good, and we move on. But the, the part, the comment you made right now where you said, look, the problem isn't with the L, the, the G, or the B, or the, the G, or the, or the T. My problem is not with any one of them. My problem is with indoctrination and you imposing yourself. Dude, I don't give a shit what you want to do privately. Go do you, okay? I don't care what you want to do, how you want to please yourself. It's your choice. Go at it. Don't advertise it. Don't get in my face. Don't get in the face of my kids. Don't get in the face of my schools that my kids go to. That is where we're going to have a problem. So it's got, I don't even have a problem with the T people. The T people have their places that they go to and do the T stuff. Guess what? Go. The T people is when a Forbes chooses a Dylan Mulvaney as the highlight of one of their biggest conferences and you put them as a hero type of person. That's my problem. To me, Forbes is a bigger problem than Dylan Mulvaney. To me, TikTok, media, mainstream media that highlights these stories is the bigger problem because they're making them seem like heroes. So another kid watches and says, hey, can I be that? I'm going to get all this attention. Can I be that? I'm going to get all this attention. Exactly. It's the hero-making machine problem from the top. All the other stuff, whatever you want to do, you do your thing. Everybody has their own style of, you know, when you, 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 if you date 20 different girls, and if you're a woman, listen to this. If you're dating different guys, everybody has a different way to be pleased. No two are the same. Somebody likes this. Somebody likes that. Somebody likes this. Guess what? It's between that person and their partner. Go do your thing. Mm -hmm. Now, no one's going to be the same, right? Go do your thing. Privately, the way you want to do that. Keep it to yourself. But I love the fact that Sean Strickland has the audacity and the brass to just call it out. And by the way, he continues to say something to his opponent. What did he say? He said oh, to his opponent, this, oh. is how, this is how wild Sean Strickland is. So, what do you so, tell his so opponent? So Sean Strickland, uh, he has his own podcast called The Man Dance. He was also on Theo Vaughn's podcast, which got me emotional because he was so emotional talking about the abuse that he went through with his father and what his mother went through. And it was, if you want, if you haven't cried in a while, you want to cry, you watch it. So he's, he, uh, he warned. Uh, his the fighter that he's fighting this this Saturday, Drikas de Plessis, uh, not to cross the line ahead of their bout in Toronto, saying that if you mention his childhood trauma, uh, he goes, it's going to transcend fighting. He said, um, he goes, listen, and I quote, we're going to try to murder each other, but if you bring up that shit again, I will effing stab you. <laughs> he said he will stab him. And he goes, if I go to Canada and you bring it up, well, guess what? I'm going to jail. They're going to deport me. And we spend eight weeks for trading for no fucking reason. He goes, listen, say what you want. We're going to fight. You bring up what my father did one more time. And I'm going to stab. I believe that guy. I believe him. I'm laughing because of the key and pee, the, pee, and pee oh, yeah. clip that you did. <laughs> oh, I swear to God, you're I will take you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna take each of heart. Will watch but you. Yeah. This is the problem in the UFC. Is where's well, the limits? The, the great thing is we're allowing no limits. But we had the conversation with what Colby Covington the other day. What he said about uh, the other fighters. Was it the uh, father? Yeah. Uh, what's uh, his name's father? Anthony. Um, I, I forget the name. Whatever. Edwards. Yeah. Edwards. Anthony Edwards. Yeah. He talked about um, his dead father. 
Yeah. There's got to be some limits here to this stuff. There's either no limits yeah. or limits. Well, and in, in the UFC, there's no limits. I mean, listen, it's it's words at the end of the day. Yeah, this line right here. Leon Edwards. Yeah. Leon yeah. Edwards. Yeah, but it, this guy used my dad's death as entertainment. By the way, Colby had a great time with you. He literally choked you out after he, the podcast. Yeah. Literally. Fantastic. He did lose that fight. Yeah, but, but but I mean, in this sense, like this is childhood trauma. And, and, and again, my attitude is it's no holds barred. This guy talks trash. You got to be able to take it back. But he's just letting him know if you cross that line, these are the consequences. And I believe that he would do it. <laughs> He said, I will effing stab you in Canada. And he goes, I, all that eight weeks of training goes out the window because I'm going to go to jail. See the, the fight card? He goes, I'm going to go to jail. But this weekend, he's defending his title against – this yeah. is his first defense, right, Pat? Because he beat uh, – uh, 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 who's the tall guy that he beat up? Uh, Israel Adesanya. Israel Adesanya. Which, which we saw in Miami, by the way. By the oh, way, yeah. that's coming up in March. I'm sure we're, we're all aware. We're definitely going that. John Strickland. This- Listen, here's what I do know about the UFC. What goes up must come down. Don't get too used to whoever's on the top. There's a good chance he loses this fight. I've never even heard of Driscus the Blues because what, 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 yeah, what, I, what I do know is no guy in the UFC stays on top that long. No. Name one. I, I don't know, but this this, exactly. this is going to be a fantastic. Except if your name is John Jones. Yeah. He's yeah. the only guy. Yeah. Khabib, too. And those two, yeah, Khabib yeah. and John Jones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, John Jones has one loss, but it's because he was elbowing the guy so bad that it was a technical loss because he tore the guy's oh, face, face off. Because he said something about his dad. No, no, no. <laughs> it was nothing about that. That was a different story. Okay. Fine. All right, next story here. So uh, Nikki Haley, under pressure from donors to defeat Donald Trump in New Hampshire after Iowa caucus loss. Let me read this full story to you. It's on page seven if you want to go to it. Uh, pa, pa, pa. Okay, here we go. Former United States Ambassador Nikki Haley is facing pressure from uh, some of the top donors, fundraisers to either seriously compete with or out, outright defeat Donald Trump in the next week's New Hampshire primary after finishing third on Monday in the Iowa caucus. I would still like to see her get somewhere, but the mountain she has to climb is enormous. Andy Sabin, a New York businessman, and Haley's fundraiser told CNBC, Haley's fundraiser, by the way. As much as I like Haley, I don't even know what Trump could do to stop himself right now. Saban plans to help raise money for Trump if Haley doesn't make it through the prime. Did you hear that, Tom? Saban plans to help raise money for Trump if Haley doesn't make it through the primary season, despite previously telling CNBC he wouldn't give the former president an effing nickel. He may be the only choice I have, said Saban. She needs to win. Or a very, very close second place, said a lobbyist who is raising money for Haley. Tom. The numbers are out. So St. Anselm, nobody hears that name until it's time for uh, uh, the New Hampshire primary because they usually give their, their school and their stage to the debate. So you'll hear about that. They also run one of the better polls in New Hampshire. So... Real clear politics is out there, and I, you know, I'm sorry, I got to call this out. I'm going to make an enemy here, but Do real clear politics likes to take like the last five polls and average them as as if they're all different. It's like taking five UFC fighters and averaging them. You can't. One's a grappler, one's a fighter, one's a puncher, one's a kick. You, you know what I mean, Pat? Wrestler. You can't average it. Yet real clear politics makes its 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 bones averaging it. So they've got. Haley getting closer, 46.3 to 34, according to recent New Hampshire. No. Now with Christie out, Suffolk and St. Anselm went out and did a poll. It's 52 for Trump on Suffolk, 50 for Trump on St. Anselm, and Haley at 36 or 38 on a good day. And DeSantis, well, the DeSantis voters are going to come Nikki's way because they can smell blood in the water. Okay, well, he's got like 5.2% in either poll. So the point is here... She is hell and gone from winning this thing. And the only reason she's going to be second is she's the last person standing. So what we have here is everybody sees the reality now. The deals are being made in the back rooms. It's all been set. As soon as Nikki's done with um, New Hampshire, Pat, and she's going to lose this thing by 14, 15 points, she's going to lose. And then she's looking at New Hampshire, excuse me, South Carolina, her home state that she's woefully behind in her home state. And even if you clear any of the Christie support in South Carolina, which was negligible, you know, Christie didn't campaign there. Apparently we're in the free buffets. And, <laughs> and then you take DeSantis who didn't do well there, even though he's a Southern governor, you still have her light years behind 
Trump and South Carolina. So everybody's looking at it and saying, okay, 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 we got to stop here. All of the maybes is over. All of the hope is done. Hope is dead. Maybes are almost dead. So what are we doing here? And the answer is we have one choice. The election matters. What do I got to do? And what do you have? Andy Sabin saying, you know what? As much as I like her, it's time to get serious about who's going to win this election. It's now no longer about your primary candidate. It's about winning. And the drapes are slowly closing on the stage, and that's where we are. So all of this hope about Nikki Haley aren't looking at things, and even real clear politics out there publishing these averages that aren't correct. You know, the last two ones there, we can see what's happening. It's going to be a 15-point victory. In New Hampshire. Absolutely. And Thir- she'll be second place. 13 to 15. She'll be second place because everybody else is dead. <laughs> Everybody else is gone. They've either pulled out or they're like DeSantis who put all of his marbles in, in Iowa. So, so you think, you think uh, uh, I don't know, man. I mean, at this point, what, like if I'm a money guy, you yeah. know, I'm like the main money guy. I'm like, hey, DeSantis, Haley, what are you guys doing? Can we just stop? Like, like, yeah, seriously, stop? You, this, this is not even a race anymore. Right, it's like- You're smart. You have money. What are you doing giving your money to a, to a campaign that is not Loser. going to win? Yeah, it's what like it's like betting on a horse with, with yeah. one leg broken. You're like, what what, what am I doing? And what was that, Rocky Three, where his uh, trainer, Burgess Meredith, can't stand to see it, and he doesn't want him to get really hurt, he and he actually in throws in the towel. He didn't want to do it. He thought Rocky had a chance. That's where we are. It's over. Yeah. Look, uh, we're going to be hearing the following names for the next week or two, and then we're not going to hear them anymore. The one, first one is Ron DeSantis after he places third in New Hampshire. His campaign is done. So, Ron, uh, continue to do a good job here in Florida. We'll support you here in Florida. You're not going to be our next president. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, Nikki Haley, you've got a, probably two more weeks. You're going to do your thing in New Hampshire. You're going to come in second. All right, you're going to waste a lot of money. Then you're going to go to South Carolina and still lose in your home state. And then eventually all the... Uh, <laughs> Everyone in the media is going to realize that Donald Trump is going to be the nominee, and there's a, a, a path between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and we all see how that's going to go. And even Bill Ackman, who basically said, "Listen, I, I, you know, he's funding uh, Dean Phillips up in Minnesota because he's realizing, holy shit, guys, what is happening? We're about to wheelchair sleepy Joe Biden into this <laughs> election versus Donald Trump." And again, guys, things have changed in the last four to eight years. That's the whole point. So um, I think that Trump is going to be the runaway victor here. I think that Haley's got a couple weeks left. Ron, thank you for your service. Uh, And Vivek, thank you for all you've done to basically bring awareness to all the disruption that's going on in the world. But this is all fun. This is all fodder. But we're about to see this play out. Donald Trump is going to be your nominee. With all that being said, I just when I see Biden and I've been seeing Kamala just cackling, absolutely zero, zero substance from whenever she talks. They are way too calm for a party that's just, uh, it's blatantly obvious that they're losing, but they're way too calm as if they're comfortable. They're basically, they know know something's, they're basically the orchestra on the Titanic just being like, and the ship is going, (laughs) but Pat, Pat, I watch it. I listen to every single thing that he says. I've been watching, she's been making a couple of rounds right now. They are so happy and relaxed. It's as if they're like, guys, we're good. We already, they already have, their plans already set. If you guys don't think, the left, the Democrats, you, what, you don't? You don't think. Hey, there's oh, no you, way. I'm, you, just, I'm, you just, I'm addressing your thing. There's no way sitting, they're sitting around. In reality, I know and like it's a great skit. I, we should probably do something like that. Yeah. In reality, no one's sitting around being like, <laughs> we got this thing. I, we just saw Donald Trump basically have the biggest uh, victory in Iowa. We have we're, we're hearing stories about Obama sitting down with Biden's team, being like, "Oh, guys, uh, this ain't looking so good here, guys." Every story we hear coming out of the White House is the opposite of that narrative. They're basically like, "We're in big trouble here." Now, if we want to go down that route, if they're going to pull some some rabbit out of the hat, the DNC is way more powerful and way, have their shit way more together than the RNC. Okay, Ronda Rousey or Ronda McDaniel, whoever they're Ronda leading, the, whoever's leading the brigade over there, they can't get their stuff together. We know that there's an anti-establishment, there's establishment wing in the Republican Party. We get that the DNC has their stuff together, but don't mistake it. They're very nervous about Biden, and they know that he's a very weak candidate, I, and they're going to do anything they can to prop him up, whatever that means. But I, they are not sitting. I, I pretty. don't think we I can, don't think they're nervous about. <clears throat> I, I don't think that they're nervous at all because whatever they're going to do, the whole, the Trump trying to keep Trump off the ballot thing, they're realizing none of it's none of that's going to work. But guess what? They have Plan A, they have Plan B, they have 
Plan C. None of it's going to be by accident. And they do they have a chart of what they're going to do. They have like an afuera. Oh, yeah. but this afuera, it's going to come down to what's going to be the thing. This is my thing because, mind you, when it was 2020, besides the FBI at Twitter stopping all the stories, what were the odds that this crazy virus leaked from this place? And they're already talking about another one from a country that we can't even talk about. You couldn't even say China without being racist. So what I'm saying is they look way too comfortable for me in my eyes as if they already know. Biden knows he's not going to do it, bro. There's no there's no way Joe Biden can actually go up on the stage right now and debate with Donald Trump. There's absolutely he would. What what can he say? Because all the shit that he says right now that nobody checks him on that nobody re refutes him. If he talks about b the Bidenomics, Look, he's crushed. If he wants to win Biden, he's going to have to get up on stage. If he doesn't show up to debates, that is the nail in the coffin for his campaign. There's a hundred percent. If he is the candidate, a hundred percent chance that he's going to have to debate. If not, like Trump, we all understand that he took some criticism, especially with Nikki and, De Nikki and DeSantis for not showing up on the yeah. on the JV debate stage. Yeah. But there's never been a debate, a presidential election, without an actual debate. Tom, That'd be a horrible look for Biden. Tom, this presidential campaign on both sides. There are only a few dates left, and they're not the date of these next two primaries. Everybody talked about it. Everybody's pulling their money back, all that. The next date is February 8th. That is the date that the Supreme Court will hear the arguments against uh, the Colorado Supreme Court to be overturned on keeping him off the ballot. The next date after that will be around February 22nd, where the Supreme Court decision will come down. There are three Trump-appointed Supreme Court justices and Clarence Thomas. That's four in the bag, ladies and gentlemen. All you need is John Roberts. You don't even need one more. Mm -hmm. And you have one more in your pocket. All you need is that. And that is a 5-4 decision at minimum, and I think it's going to be 7-2, that says you can't take him off the ballot. You can't do that. So that way, that clears Maine, that clears Colorado. There's your next date. Now, that's straight to the convention. The next date will be August 20th or 21st in Chicago, Illinois, where the superdelegates will shift and they will move Biden off the ballot, and they will put either Gavin Newsom or Michelle Obama on the ballot. That's wow. there's your dates, guys. That's February eighth, February twenty second, like August twenty twenty first. We're not saying like it's back. <clears throat> no, 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 Adam. By just, the way, if you get all the way down there, say, and my opinion Biden, is, my opinion is, everyone's been saying like, oh, well, Michelle Obama, she's going to be the next president. She's going to be the next. Adam, Adam, be let me back it up. We've me, seen, we've seen no indication that they're taking Adam, Biden off the why ballot. Why would they show? Why would they show their hand this early? Adam, then let's back up. February eighth is a done deal date. February twenty second is a done deal limit on Supreme Court giving a a, 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 a deliberated mm -hmm. decision. That's going to happen. August 20th and 21st is the day of the Democratic convention. If option one, they walk out with Biden and Kamala, this thing's over. Yeah. If they're going to make a change, that's where they make the change. So all I think that's way too late to make a change. You're talking about two months before the election. I'm they're going to do it now. If they're going to do anything, I well, not, how long are we going to speculate and speculate and speculate and speculate and speculate? What are you they're do? running Throw Biden down a flight and of stairs Kamala and into the ground. Whatever it is, guys, until you actually see something happen, it's Biden and Kamala Harris. They're Biden about their, to get trounced by Trump and whoever he picks. They're biding their time. They know what That's they're doing. That's my point. If they, they walk they're out of the convention August 20, 21st, yeah. I think and, the election's over. And, and I'm telling and, you right and, now. And, and uh, we talked about Trump's VP, and I apologize. I did call out Sarah. Huffey. I was making a distinction. I said if Trump has that option of who to pick, he's going to pick a pretty woman like a Christy Noem. And I was being hyperbolic about Sarah Huckabee. That's all it was. Okay. That's all I was saying. And guess what I'm that. saying? Oh, so, Tom, the date, the February 22nd date that you wrote down, that's the day that... that on or by. It, on or February by. 8th is in stone. The Supreme Court will hear the oral arguments. They'll hear it. On and it, they decide and when. And then it's usually 14 days. On or by. Okay. And I'm just... FYI, if these cheating, you know what, actually go through with it, which it doesn't look like it is. God willing, it doesn't. That end of February can turn into a very, very ugly end of the month. If the Americans, real American patriots, are not going to be happy that the left, what's it called, election interfering, what they're doing, cheating, goes through, it's not going to be. It's not going to be good, bro. I the mean, Americans are not going to be happy. I don't know how you speculate that three justices appointed by Trump and Clarence Thomas and John Roberts. That's five four. You know, that's no, how, that is we, fact. That's not speculation. That's, 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 that's not, not speculation. My, if those people, if those people flip, 
support the uh, Colorado. And remember, the Colorado Supreme Court was a thin decision. It was 5-4, and there were three people on the— no, two, two that were in the four that basically wrote a dissenting opinion that basically started with the words, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. The dissenting opinion in on that 5-4 decision for the Colorado Supreme Court could not have been stronger. It's like, what the hell are we doing here? But it was an activist decision. It's going down, and that gives him a clear run all the way to the to the uh, to the convention for Trump. He's the guy. It's just a matter of who's his VP going to be. That's all there is on that side. Don't forget what we learned from Alina Haba. She's like, this is all getting thrown out. Trump's lawyer. So she, yeah. we'll see what happens. And I truly believe that they should not determine who wins the game in the pregame. Let them play the game. That's why all right, you let's play Let's go to the, the last game. story. We got the last. You're funny. Let's go, to, let's go to the last story here before we wrap up. Do we do... Russia, Iran, China making moves for World War III. Do we do white, black, Hispanic, Asian Americans all back death of DEI yes. poll? Do you want to do that one? Let's go through that let's one. Go, let's go U.S., go local for the big listeners. Do, what does that Sounds mean? That one? The, like the DEI. Oh, okay, rather yeah, rather than go, playing out World War III. All right, let's do that. White, black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans all back death of DEI. And there's a poll that just came out here. Let's go through it, Rob, if you want to pull this up. I love this. <laughs> okay, here we go. So a Gallup poll conducted in 2023 revealed that 68% of U.S. adults viewed the Supreme Court's decision to eliminate race as a factor in college admissions as mostly a good thing. This sentiment transcends ethnic backgrounds with substantial support from Asian, white, Hispanic, and even black Americans. Among black respondents, 52% considered the ruling a positive development highlighting widespread approval. The survey reflects the ongoing debate surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, initiatives in the United States. Billionaire Elon Musk has vocally criticized DEI, saying that DEI must die due to concerns of reverse racism. TikTok has become a platform for younger Americans to voice their opinions on diversity targets, while conservative activists are advocating to, for the removal of programs that provide advantages to minorities in the private sector. Tom? I... I, I I look at things on this, and I think underneath the surface, there is a sensibility in all American citizens of all colors, not among all of them. But I think that there, I believe that there is a, just like the survey shows, that a percent of Asians, percent of Hispanics, percent of African Americans or black Americans, I don't mean to label you one way or the other. I know some of you want to be called one or the other. I'm just saying all people of color, I believe there's sensibilities under there. And I think they're seeing it like this. I think they see things like, and I'll give you an example, Harvard's in the news, so we'll bring up Harvard. When they take students and they say, hey, because of your color, you can get into Harvard. And here's a little bit of financial aid. And they're not really ready for Harvard, unfortunately, tragically, because of the school systems, but they give them a, an on-ramp there. And then they go get student loans, and then they drop out of Harvard. Who do you help? You help nobody, because that person of color is now sitting there with, with debt that they've got. Yo, you're giving you a privilege, and we're bragging about it, but these things happen. Those things are happening all over the place, and I think there's sensibilities that are in the average American. We should give the average American of all colors a little credit here, because beyond the screeching and screaming that happens on cable news networks led by a certain bespectacled woman on MSNBC, they are sitting there with some sensibilities under it beyond the screaming and the yelling. Mm -hmm. This gives me hope that, that for America, and it gives me hope that people's voices are being heard because there's a lot of, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, happening among people of color who do not universally support what has been the scourge of DEI. Adam. Uh, well, look, sometimes you got to scratch beneath the surface to see what's really going on. So we've learned that during the BLM riots. It's like, if a Black Lives Matter, of course they do. Well, who's not saying that? When you peel back the curtain, well, it turns out they're a communist Marxist, basically scam artist. Yep. Same thing that's going on with Gaza. When you start asking people what's going on there, they're like, oh, what? I didn't realize what this uh, socialist antifada is. Oh, I didn't know. Same thing that's going on with DEI. I fully agree that DEI must die. And what it sounds like on the surface, diversity, equity, inclusion, that's great. Same thing with ESG, economic, uh, envi environmental, social, it's got, it all sounds great. But when you look in the details, the devil's always in the details. It's like, yeah, I don't know about all this affirmative action stuff. I don't know about this judging on everything about race. I don't know about the fact that in the Fortune 100 companies, they only hired 6% of their employees who are white, even though 60% of Americans are white. Uh, something don't add here. So it's very encouraging here to see that 
black, white, yellow, brown, Puerto Rican, and Haitian, all my friends from the Zulu Nation, everyone's basically realizing that DEI must die. So what we learned also is that the pendulum swings from the left to the right, and the reversion to the mean is the equilibrium. And I'll say one thing, and I want to give a shout out to one person, Vivek Ramaswamy. This guy, if there's anything that I remember from his entire campaign, is just harping on the woke and the DEI and the ESG. He was amazing at that. And you saw the joke that the Babylon Bee just did about Vivek. Rob, right? pull that up. It's just, it's, it's hilarious. So, Go ahead. But this guy is an absolute beast. He's probably one of the smartest guys we've ever sat down, sat down with. I said that he's the Andrew Tate of politics, disruptor, gifted speaker. You might not agree with him. You may agree with him, but you can't look away. The guy's an absolute beast. Babylon B basically made a joke about him being Indian, 7-Eleven. One of the things I believe, you know, I'm getting a racist uh, uh, epithet these days. It's not racist if you make fun of everybody. If you single out one group and one group only, but any group can get it. I make fun of Jewish people, Catholic people, Muslim Zoom people, in. Here go. everything. So here's the Babylon B making fun of Vivek. <laughs> I mean, that's just funny, Trump bro. Trump promises Vivek an administration position running the White House 7-Eleven. That's, okay. Okay, that's funny. The reason that's Sorry. funny <laughs> is funny. because this guy could literally have any job in the administration. Yeah. That's how gifted he is. That's so funny. It's a joke. It's a satire. And I guarantee you someone like Vivek is going to take it in stride and be like, ha ha, funny, funny, go fuck yourself. Yeah. All right, can I go count my billions of dollars that I'm going to get yeah. You know, after this thing? So Vivek's a beast. I think DEI should die, and that's my final and, thoughts. And, I, and, I, and here's the thing. When it comes to the DEI, I'm so happy that people of all races are waking up. It, if it, like I said, if it's Starbucks and you're like, we have to hire a certain amount, fi fine, go do it. But when you have, when real life decisions and real lives are at stake, mm -hmm. I have a problem. When Joe Biden says, I'm just, the white black president is just going to be a, 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 a black woman, a, a woman of color. It's like, you, I want the best person that's qualified for the job. So when you have somebody going, I don't care, I'm only going to hire this race. Or when you have United saying, I want crazy bastards <laughs> eating crayons <laughs> that, that, our that are gay and they're like, like what yeah. do we do? And like, or Supreme Court justices, I want the best person at the job, and that is it. I so listen, listen, to, amen to that. Listen, amen amen to, that. To, to wrap up here, when I saw that story, uh, of Babylon B. I thought it was just appropriate to make a stop. Look go at, ahead. Oh, this, this, go ahead, Rob. Oh, you're so funny. Rob, go ahead. See, this is a dream. When you make money, you get to afford to buy some high-end type of food. Oh, and I want to go now. It's more high-end than hot dogs at 7-Eleven. I mean, I, I just thought it was and appropriate. Had this, I want to go. You want to go for lunch, 7-Eleven? How are you feeling, Eric? My friend Vivek is going to Eric. Look at Eric. Oh, Eric looks oh, good. Oh, Eric, he looks good. Look, look, look. You know, my God. Oh, you got to eat one of those per year, man. It's just insane. Anyways, all right. So end of the podcast. Vinny. Give I, us the final uh, uh, verdict I, I, on Manek before have, we wrap first it up. First of all, guys, I love you. I've had at least 20 while I've been in here. I love you guys. Keep them coming because we're almost at 500. I said I'd give a 10 shout out. Jane Stanridge. Jane Stanridge. I also want to give her a shout out. She gave you five in a row. She yeah. gave me. She gave Tom. Guys, if you haven't been no, on no, this no. app. She, she asked Jane me one question. She asked she you one. Said, Tom, stay out of this. Shut I'm, up. All no, right. She asked me one yeah. question. I'm giving That's five great. to Vinny. Is that the right yeah, By the way, I won't be here what? tomorrow because me and Jane are getting married to run away together, so much, guys. I, I said I'd give you guys a shout out. you said about her last night? Michelle Medina, Ricardo Frias, Jonathan Schneider, Armin. Uh, well, how do you say that last name, Pat Armenian? Hammer. Armen Kaimakian. Good. Oh my that's, God. that's my boy. Russell Crowe, uh, Sammy Side, Brian Adams, Lee Little, Nick Kolinich. Wait a minute. And Christopher <laughs> Gibson. I appreciate you guys. Guys, Manek me. We're almost there. Where are we at? Where are the numbers at, Pat? You, you are, you're up there, man. You're, you're uh, uh, I don't know the exact. I think you flipped it. Is it flipped? I was. I wrote it somewhere around here. But anyways, we're oh, yeah. going to wrap up. You're getting closer to 500. But by the way, Tom also got a lot of Manek's while on the podcast today. So did Adam. So if you want to support yeah. Adam, go to Manek with Adam do as I, well. Can I read my names or only no. No, 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 no. We're going to wrap up. We're going to wrap up. We're going to wrap up. The system is rigged. Tomorrow. Rigged. Rob, is what time tomorrow? What time tomorrow? 3 p.m.? Tomorrow, 3 yes, p.m. Yep. with Glenn Beck. Tomorrow, 3 p.m. with Glenn Beck. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.